Radio IMWS. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to uh, another edition of Election Special on Radio IMWS. I'm Brother Muhammad and we will be with you for the next hour on and a little bit, hopefully, inshallah, um, uh, cr- 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 sorry, asking our guest some important questions. Anyway, um, now, uh, on May the 7th, voters up and down the country will head off to their local polling stations with an eye to vote in a local MP and a government. With just 10 weeks to go before the general election, it's important to make an informed decision and use your vote to shape politics on a local and national level with issues that matter to you. With this in mind, Radio Radio IMWS will be giving an opportunity for local candidates to come into the studio and give you, our listeners, a chance to ask them the questions that matter to you. I am Brother Mohammed, as I said, and joining me co-hosting this evening, we do have again uh, Brother Ayub. Bismillah, Ayub. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, listeners. Uh, are you there anything you want to add to that? I do, yes. Uh, welcome again, once again, to our election special. Uh, and first of all, I'd like to welcome Joe Cox to the, our IMWS uh, studio. Joe, welcome to IMWS Radio. And first of all, May I take this opportunity to thank you, well, not to thank you, I'll thank you later, but to congratulate you on being selected as the parliamentary Labour candidate for Buckley and Spen. Thank you very much, and it's, it's a real honour to be here with you tonight. Excellent. Right. And uh, just before we start, uh, like we've said before, uh, Radio IMWS election special, uh, and to make it very clear to our listeners that we as Radio IMWS will be very much neutral and do not intend to promote any particular candidate or a party. However, we will try our very best to present our listeners, or rather to represent our listeners, the IMWS members and the wider community's interests. And to this end, we will challenge candidates on what they stand for and how they will benefit the community. I hope you feel comfortable with that, Joe. Very comfortable. Very comfortable. Good. Um, so, as uh, so, so listeners, as uh, as already been mentioned, our guest today is the Labour uh, Labour candidate for Batley and Spen, Joe Cox. If you do want to ask a question, easy enough. Just send <laughs> us a text or WhatsApp to zero seven four six zero eight zero nine two one eight. Um, we will be taking uh, texts and WhatsApps uh, right from now. So do send them in. But we will uh, we are going to give Joe a little time, as we've done with all the candidates so far. Um, Joe, first of all, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're standing in the Batley seat. Lovely, thank you. And thanks for this opportunity. And uh, good evening to everyone out there on a cold, rainy, miserable night in, in Batley. Um, and, um, and, th- and as I say, thank you for this chance to come and talk to your listeners, which you know, I think is a really important part of politics. And you know, everyone out there needs to make a very informed decision about how they're going to vote on the 7th of May. But first of all, let me say, you know, I do encourage people out there to vote. Make sure you're registered. Make sure you've got a voice. This this is an election that matters like no other. Um, and I certainly think it's a sort of generational change election, something where you have to have a voice. So get registered and, and do vote. Um, so I'm Joe Cox. I uh, was born and bred in Batley and Hetmondwijk, went to Hetmondwijk Grammar School, <clears throat> come from a very uh, very working class background. Um, my family have lived here for, for generations and you know, it's the sort of this constituency is very much in, in my blood um, and I'm very passionate about our area. I think I think Batley and Spen's a very unique bit of the UK and it's, it's, it's a place we should all be very, very, very proud of, whether that's you're newly arrived here or whether you've been here for, for, many, for many, many decades. Um, and I, uh, I was the first person in my family to go to university. I worked very, very hard to get to Hepburn Dyke Grammar School and then went to Cambridge University and, um, and studied very, very hard there. Found it very difficult as a working class girl from Yorkshire to survive in what was quite a privileged academic environment, but, but fought very hard for a place there and made, uh, made very, very sure that I, I survived and, and left with a very good degree. And, and then I've worked all over the world. Um, I've worked from Afghanistan to Gaza to to Batley to to London and lived in New York and Brussels in between. And my career up to now has really been about representing the most vulnerable people, whether that's children who've been victims of child abuse in the UK, kids who are going to bed hungry in Birmingham or Bradford, um, or people in in Gaza and Afghanistan who've been suffering from, you know, decades of of conflict and violence and and live in incredibly insecure situations. And I've come to the conclusion after 20 years working in the voluntary sector that 
you know, politics really matters and we need to make politics more normal, more approachable. I think many people feel politicians are out of touch with what's going on in people's lives and I actually think that's true and we need to change politics. But I also think, you know, we need politicians who have got real values and vision and they know why they're entering politics. They know what causes they're going to champion and why they're doing this. And I feel very clearly that after my 20 years working very hard on a lot of this, of these issues, I'm very clear mm. about why I want to do this. And hopefully mm. we'll get into some of that. Right. OK. Uh, that's fine. Um, are you, I know you want to, you've got to... Yes. Thanks very much, uh, Joe, for that. Uh, that sounds brilliant. Uh, I'm going to ask you about... Uh, a philosophical question on politics. Where do you stand on the f political spectrum? What is your political philosophy and your alliances? And who are the politicians that have inspired you or do still inspire you? Great questions. I'm, I've always been a socialist. I'm, a, you know, I'm, a, I'm Labour through and through. The Labour Party's values of fairness, decency, justice fighting for the underdog, you know, championing respect for, for families and communities, but also n not shying away from people who aspire to a better life. You know, mm. we, we want the best for our kids. And, and the Labour Party has always, for me, been a beacon of hope for people who are the most vulnerable, the most needed, but also people who care about their communities and their families and want to give something back. So I am Labour through and through. I'm a socialist through and through. And that's, that's definitely where I'm, where I'm positioned and always will be positioned. Super. Now, following in Mike Wood's footsteps, if you are elected, it would be quite a task. He's been a fantastic MP for our constituents. What do you consider to be your style of working as a prospective parliamentarian? It's been said in, in some circles that you may be a career politician, in the sense that you may be wanting some sort of ministerial role in the future, which in itself may not be a bad thing for Batten and Spen. So what's your style going to be? Well, look, I, th I think, first of all, you know, let, let's celebrate Mike's enormous Absolutely, service yes. i mean he's you know he's given 17 years good years and worked tirelessly for many families in this area and you know the number of doors i knock on and the number of people i speak to the number of families that he has personally been to help whether that's on a difficult immigration case or a benefits problem or something that's really destroying their lives he's been there and you know he's got big shoes and i'm going to i'm yes. going to i'm going to mm. strive very hard to f f to fill them in terms of what sort of politician I want to be, I think it's two things. You know, the first is that to be a good politician, you need to understand what families and the communities that you're representing are going through. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've spent all day today knocking on doors in Hetman Dwyck and Batley. I was out this morning with the Police and Crime Commissioner for West Yorkshire knocking on doors in Hetman Dwyck and we had a good briefing with Hetman Dwyck police officers this morning on local crime. We spent this afternoon on Warwick Road. We met lots of people coming out of the mosques at Bromley Street and Whitaker Street, and that is all about talking to people so that you can understand people's lives. And there's a lot of people out there probably listening tonight who are struggling at the moment. You know, 25% mm -hmm. of people in our area don't earn a living wage. There's a lot of people sick and worried about the closure, the downgrade of Dewsbury Hospital and whether they can get a GP appointment for their kids in the next couple of days. There's people out there who need to know they've got someone who's approachable as a politician, who's real and genuine. And, you know, I'm a mum first and foremost. My, my husband, Brendan, is here tonight with me. And, um, you know, that family commitment and that being approachable approachable and, and very, very available to people is definitely something that, that, that I believe politicians have to be if they're going to be any good. But, you know, I think one of the reasons that um, I want to enter politics is that I think consistently Batley and Spen is marginalised. We are not Wakefield, we're not Huddersfield and we're not Leeds and we're not London. And this area needs a representative who is going to stand up for people around here, regionally and nationally, with a very strong voice and a clear agenda that puts people's needs in Batley and Spen first. And so, yeah, I do have ambitions to be a loud, mm. vocal politician in London and Westminster and nationally and internationally, because a lot of people talk to me about mm -hmm. international issues. If you want to have influence on these things, you need to have presence and you need to be brave enough to stand up and say no or yes, things need to change. Mm. Great. OK, just go back a little bit. Uh, I did ask you about the politicians that have inspired you uh, and 
that some who may still inspire you. Who are they? It's funny you say that, actually. So last night we, um, I hosted a very big event at the Arkash <coughs> Indian restaurant in Cleckheaton. So we had about 250 um, Labour Party members and supporters, local businessmen, teachers, nurses. And it was a great event. And the keynote speaker was Neil Kinnock. Um, and Glenis Kinnock was there as well. Mm-hmm. And we had trade union speakers and an actress who grew up in Burstall and was in Coronation Street, came and spoke. But Neil rocked. You know, he spoke from the heart about the values that the Labour movement has always held Mm -hmm. dear. He, you know, people, we gave it, he had a stand innovation at the end of the night (coughs) because he spoke passionately about (coughs) why he entered politics. So he is someone that I think has always stood up for the underdog, has always been true to himself, you know, came from an incredibly humble background and went on to be the leader of the Labour Party and has fought very, very hard for a lot of the things I hold dear and speaks passionately and eloquently and from the heart about the principles about why politicians, you know, need to do a good job. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, I was always a big fan of Mo Molum. I don't know if you remember Mo Molum. She was Northern Ireland mm. secretary. She was in the, la- in the last Labour government. A very, very mm. down-to-earth woman who always spoke her mind and was ne- was someone you, you felt that you could always have a, a nice cup of tea with, but also you knew would be on your side if you needed someone to stand up mm. to the Israeli government or the American government or the Northern Ireland governments and political parties. So Mo was a big was a big heroine of mine. Thank you. Thanks, Mohammed. Right. OK, and now then, listeners, um, we have had text messages coming in. I have been keeping an eye on them, and we will uh, be asking those messages. Don't worry if you've, if you've not heard your question yet. You, it will be on the air shortly. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. But if you do want to send a question in, uh, do so by text or WhatsApp this evening on 07460809218. Excuse me, Joe. Uh, now then, Joe, um, what do you see are the, are the uh, big issues for the people of Batley in Spain? Well, I mean, a lot of things come up on the doorstep when I talk to people and I've hosted many, many public meetings in the last few months. Um, I think the top three for me are the hospital. You know, everybody talks to me about the fear about the downgrade. And let's be clear, you know, this was uh, supported by the the Tory MP in Dewsbury. And I would would want to know what the position of of any Conservative candidate is on the downgrade. You know, it's an issue that is deeply worrying families up and down this constituency. It's it's the hospital I was born in. You know, my uncle had Mm. cancer treatment and diagnosis there recently. We had, had to go to Pinderfield. So this is an issue that's not just theoretically important. It's actually really affected my family. And and I know many people out there are really worried. What happens if you get sick? What happens if you're pregnant? And, and something goes wrong and you need to be zipped over to Pinderfields, which is potentially 45 minutes to an hour and a half or two bus journeys away. So, you know, that comes up a lot. And I've made sure I've had um, meetings with the, with the CCG, the care commissioning group, and some of the local doctors and, and managers involved in that decision with a view to, you know, understanding what's going on and what, as a future Member of Parliament, I would have the scope to try and change and stop to make sure that we keep vital health services at Dewsbury. Mm. The things that particularly worry me at Dewsbury are the maternity services you know this is a high birth rate area and we've got low birth weight of infants now that's dangerous you know and i i want guarantees and i've asked the 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 doctors involved for guarantees that no woman out there who's pregnant now will be needlessly worrying about this so the hospital first and foremost i think the second thing you know is jobs and regeneration so you need a decent job. If you're, if you're about to leave school and you're out there listening to this, you want to know that you're going to find a job that's going to give you a decent income. That means you're going to be able to save for a house or save mm. for, a, for, for a holiday, whatever you want, or save for your kids' future. So, you know, we need, we need to think about how are we going to give not just kids, but, you know, everyone of working age a decent job in Batley and Spain. And let's remember the last Tory government decimated this area and the, tech, the proud textile tradition we've got around here which many of my family worked in um, and you know one of the things I've been doing is talking a lot to manufacturers and local businessmen about and women about you know should we have some sort of manufacturing summit here to talk about the future of those brilliant employers that are thriving locally and employing a lot of people but who perhaps need a bit of help whether that's on business rates or whether that's on you know finding properties if they want to expand 
and just thinking about how government and how council can be a helping hand for these businesses because they need we need them to be employing lots of people, um, but mm-hmm. employing them fairly, you know. And as, mm. as I said earlier, twenty five percent of people in Batley and Spend don't earn a living wage. So one of the commitments of a Labour government would be to make sure that the minimum wage is raised substantively, so that no, people are actually. One of the biggest problems in Batley is okay. there aren't any businesses left in Batley. If you go down into the town centre, half the shops are closed and more closing mm. each day. That's right. I'd just like to get this um, uh, this Certainly, message, yeah. uh, this question from uh, from a listener, and it also adds. Uh, okay, it's regarding the duty hospital, which you just mentioned. Um, the, the listener asks, uh, what have you done to stop the downgrading of important services at Dewsbury Hospital? What is the current status of the campaign? Uh, if Labour come into government, does, uh, do you intend, uh, do you have any, re- uh, or does she have any reassurances that a Labour government will stop reverse the downgrading of services at Dewsbury Hospital? Absolutely bl- brilliant question. So whoever sent that in, thank you. So I've, I mean, I've joined the campaigners out on the on the lines outside, you know, Dewsbury Hospital and and down at Dewsbury Town Hall, protesting around fear about mm. the changes. I've had good meetings with the two brilliant women who are actually running and orchestrating the campaign. And actually, hats off to them, you know, Sorry, community. Who? So Trish, um, Trish, and I can't remember her name. Trish and Christine, I think it is brilliant. And they okay. they they. Non-political, they are community activists right. who are championing the campaign, and they gave me a brilliant briefing on, you know, what what people around the constituency are doing of themselves and how I could be of help to them. Um, and you know, the, the other thing I said I've, I've done before, which I mentioned, is a, a very long meeting with the with the managers and the GPs involved in the downgrade decision about exactly what are the parameters now that they are looking at about the future of Dewsbury and. You know, now let's. What would I do? You know, what would a Labour mm. government do? Now let's be clear. Some of these decisions <laughs> have been taken, and I'm not going to be the sort of p- politician that promises nirvana. You can't reverse some of these things. A Tory government has put in place a lot of decisions in the last four years that we will not be able to reverse overnight. And let's be clear about that. And what I'd say to some of your listeners is, if you don't like what's happened in the last four years, you need to think very, very hard about what you want, what would happen under a future Conservative government. Another five years of these kind of decisions are deeply, deeply worrying. But what I would say is, you know, I still think there are, there is a fight to be had to prevent the further downgrade of Dewsbury. And if I hear and there's any evidence to the effect that anyone in this constituency is being negatively affected by any of the things that have already happened, we need to be willing to be out there campaigning very, very hard to protect so do you think the services. A Labour government would make a difference to what might happen to Dewsbury Hospital? I think, I mean, look, I think at a national level, there's a clear, there's clear blue water between what the Conservatives are going to do to public services, not just the NHS, mm. but public services, and what a Labour government would do. So the Conservative government, the Conservative Party have been very clear, they're going to take public spending de- levels down mm. to what they were in the 1930s. That's before we had an NHS. There is no way the NHS, as your listeners now experience it, can survive at those kind mm. of levels of public funding. Okay. And what the Labour Party has said <coughs> is we will we'll implement implement a whole series of measures, including a mansion tax and many other things, to raise money to invest in the health service. Now, right. investment is not enough by itself. It's not just about money. You know, and if you speak to most health professionals out there, they'd be very aware of the fact that they do need to change. Change needs to happen. Change is a good thing. But you can't just change. You can't squeeze the NHS okay. in such a way and expect it to still deliver. Yeah, sorry, Joe. Um, I, I'm conscious of the time, and I just want to be, uh, try and get as much of this in as well. But um, just on that, are you saying that uh, if a Labour government comes in, we cannot turn back the clock on the changes that are, are presently taking place in Dewsbury Hospital. No, I mean, we can't, we can't. The downgrade decision was taken by this government. The Tory mm. Secretary of State yeah. took this decision. Yeah. So you know, the Labour Party actively campaigned against it and was very, very vociferous, as joining many community campaigners saying this was a bad decision. That decision has now been taken. But, but let's be clear, it was by a Tory Secretary yeah, of State. But would a health. Labour government... No, well, look, look, no. You can't automatically reverse that decision overnight. Right. But on okay. day one... 
Andy Burnham, the Secretary of State, the Shadow Secretary of State for Health, has said he will reverse the Health and Social Care Act, which does introduce a whole range of elements into the NHS, which I am passionately, passionately against. Everything from increasing the scope of, for privatisation and many other re- reorganisations that we've seen in the last four years that if you speak to health professionals, they think have been a bad idea as well as it's wasted billions of money. And let's just remember as well, the Tories never said in their last manifesto at their last election they were going to do any of this. So they snuck this in by the back door and you know people didn't vote for a reorganisation of the NHS. They just implemented it. It's wasted billions at a time when money was scarce and that money could have been much better spent on frontline workers protecting nurses and GP jobs, which is what people want. It's, it's the future of the hospital, I think, that that's in question, isn't it? What might happen to the Dewsbury Hospital... Wait, was that, the, the, listener was, yeah, the listener was asking about the downgrading. Now, then, another but point... Just, just one last thing. Though, yeah. the, down, the downgrade decision was taken by the Tories, mm. and that's, that's done. Now, what, there is still a lot to play for. I am not saying let's give up, because there is still a lot to play for okay. in terms of protecting the services we've now got and making sure that if anything negative happens, we're all willing, and that includes your listeners, we're all willing mm-hmm. to stand up and say this is not acceptable. Okay. Uh, now then, um, one of the, uh, during the consultations, uh, members of the public raised the issue about the PFI, um, the uh, private finance initiative. Sorry, I forgot what I meant then for a moment. But the private finance initiative, um, there's a lot of concern around it. There was a lot of case about investors making millions whilst the hospital is having to cut because it doesn't have the money. And uh, essentially, um, uh, that's what the cuts are really about. And we all know that. Um, in October, Balfa Beatty walked away with a profit of £42.2 million for their investment. Why are investors walking away? Would Labour stop this? Because Labour, are the P- Labour did introduce the private finance initiative. Mm, as a so way would, of raising... Yeah. Really, so would, you know, yeah, right. Yeah. So, so at the moment, the trust is basically being held at a stranglehold a lot of people have this opinion, um, members of the public rather, um, that the trust is being held at stranglehold by the PFI. Mm. Would Labour do something to try and end the PFI that's on the trusts? So Labour did introduce this, but it's, it was always a tiny, tiny proportion of, uh, of, the invo- of the investment in the health service. I think it was about 5% under the last Labour government. And let's remember, this was at a time when the health service had been squeezed after 18 years of Tory rule and desperately, desperately needed money. So we, we introduced a tiny element of private investment to raise much needed money. And if you talk to people in Hetmondwijk who got a really brilliant new health centre and other hospitals up and down the country who've got brand new spanking facilities you know actually a lot of people would think that's a, that's been a good thing now I think what's happened under this government with new legislation under the Health and Social Care Act is that the door has been open the floodgate has been open to private sector involvement now that I am I am fundamentally opposed to and you know what worries me is if we don't stop that now where does that end if you have one if you have one more term of a Tory government and let's you know a Tory government without the Lib Dem coalition what would they do to the health service at the kind of levels of investment financially they're talking about with this sort of floodgate opening up in terms of public sector involvement private sector involvement I you know I am worried I've lived in America and if you are poor and vulnerable in America, you do yeah. not have health care. You know, so, what, is that the scenario we're going to end up in, in in 10 years? And, you know, for anyone who grew up in the 20s, 30s, you know, and remembers, remembers life without our NHS. You know, for me, this is an election that is about the future of the NHS. Okay. And I always think, look, you cannot trust the Conservative Party with the NHS. And Labour's got a vision to both invest money, make sure that pr- private sector involvement is mi- minimal and has governance to it. Yeah. Um, and, and we invest in frontline care. OK, um, uh, very quickly, I've got a lot of questions that, that have come in. But I Popular wanted to ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are, uh, well, actually, to be honest with you, all the three shows so far have been very popular. <laughs> keep your, keep, do keep your messages coming in. Jo has said she will stay with us. Beyond at 9 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully she'll... I mean, you've got, yeah, you've got Imtiaz's record to break. Okay, he's still the record holder on, on the election special. So You're, the, you're going to have to tell my mum. She's with my kids. Oh, that's not a problem. <laughs> um, are you going to do that? Um, okay, text or WhatsApp your questions. 0746080921. Now then, you mentioned about the privatisation. Um, CCG, Clinical Commission Groups, came into, uh, came into effect last year sometime. Mm-hmm. They've been giving a lot of tenders out, moving a lot of services out of the hospital into GPs. What's your opinion on CCGs? Oh, well, I mean, I think this is all part of the reorganisation that we, you know, we didn't need. Now, I, you know, the, again, we are where we are. 
And the Labour Party is going to have to look very carefully at what we've got. And there are some good people working in the care, in the clinical commissioning groups. I'm not I'm not just going to say they're all terrible and evil. But, you know, in terms of whether they're delivering, there's a lot of people out there concerned that they aren't delivering and they're out of touch and they're not doing the job that we need them to do. So, you know, in terms of what, what whether you just get rid of them, no. I don't think you do that auto- automatically overnight. But, you know, as I've said, Andy Burnham is cl- very clear that we are going to scrap the Health and Social Care Act immediately as soon as we get into power and look again at what the Tories have done with this reorganisation that has cost a lot of money and hasn't put people's health first. Okay, um, question for Joe. Uh, this is a uh, listener who sent this one in. Uh, if you win, how do we know you will deliver uh, after as politicians make promises at elections but then forget very quickly? That's a good question as well. That came up a lot on Warwick Road today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and I mean, what I, what I said to people today on the doorstep, what I'll say to you is... <clears throat> You know, look, you, you can hold me to account. If you don't like what service I give in the next five years, you know, if you if you elect me in the first place, then it's your prerogative to boot me out in five years' time. And, you know, I, I definitely want to be the sort of politician where if you don't think I'm doing a good job, you can come and tell me. You know, I've been giving out my mobile number all day today to people to say, look, you need to be able to tell me whether whether I, I'm doing a good job. And I think that's all I can promise, you know. And I, let's be clear, politicians can't do everything. Thing. And I think your listeners know that, actually. People aren't dumb. We, you know, we know that politicians can't solve all your problems. I think someone said to one of the people I was going out with today that he wanted a new roof and, his, um, and a new window frame in his house. Now, you know, that's not something a politician but can do. But politicians uh, promise a lot, though. They do. And I, it, it's like I said at the start, I think politics needs to change. And I am desperately trying hard during this campaign not to overpromise because mm. I think that is really dangerous. And look, look, look at what happened to President Obama. So I was in, I, I campaigned very hard for President Obama. I was living in America at the time and working at the United Nations. And, you know, I went and took three months out and went and door knocked for Obama and got people to the polling stations. And it was an amazing moment in history to be part of. And there was such hope from people and he he sort of over over raised expectations so he could never deliver on what people thought he was going to do and you know I'm not saying that it, that that was wrong because it was an amazing moment to be part of but I am and I'm not comparing myself to President Obama in any way but you know I but the, that sort of let's not over promise mm. I, I would quite like an honest conversation okay. about what yeah. can we do and what what can we not do because a lot of this is about politicians working with communities and and just an example of that so and, you know, I've hosted quite a lot of public meetings on town centre regeneration. You mentioned, you mentioned Batley having mm. empty places. Mm. You know, we've had, we've had public <clears throat> meetings with 40, 50 people come in where we've had businessmen, we've had local women, we've had, you know, we've had church leaders, m- mosque leaders talking together with me about a shared vision for Batley and for Hetmond Wyke and many of the other town centres. What can we all do? This is not just about mm. what government does for you. It's about what we do together. And I think that's very much the sort of politician I want to be. I will work really hard. And for anyone who's met me or worked with me in the last few months or ever, actually, you know, if you've got my commitment, you've got it 100%. Mm. But I need your commitment, too, that we're going to have okay. to work together. What, Joe, do think, what do you think is the problem? Prob- the problem is in Buckley in terms of empty shops. Well, look, I think it's footfall, you know, first and foremost. People aren't, there's not enough people going into Batley to justify taking a... a, a but they a, are, a, they're going to Tesco's. Well, that's it, but they're not going into the town. They're going to Red Brick Mill and they're going to Tesco's. What we need to find a way of doing is channeling them back into Batley. And so, you know, some of the things we've been talking about have been a sort of unique identity for Batley that draws people mm. into the town centre, not just to Tesco's and to Red Brick Mill. And, and there's a lot of ideas on the table, whether it's a sort of Asian food festivals or a regular market selling either vintage clothes or Asian food or, you know, we sort of, we need to find a creative way or whether there's an arts dimension to this. There's a lot of creative arts people involved in some of the projects I'm working on. And, and But also there's a role for the council, you know, can we give... A, a kind of rent holiday to some of the market traders so that they can establish tr- trade in stalls and then build from that. Or well, can that we give wouldn't work, really, down? because, yes, uh, sorry, in the budget this Wednesday, the council announced that they were going to shut down Batley, uh, Batley and Burstall Markets. I know, I know. And, uh, I mean, it's just such a tragedy, isn't it? It but is. We, yeah. 
But what's but I, I mean? What's, I, 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 you, you've talked I, about regeneration, and I know a while ago you also set up a, a, a group to look into that. And what's what's the, what's the secret ingredient? Because we have been under a Labour a Labour MP for the past eighteen years. Mm. There has been a Labour council around us as well. Mm. Um, we have had a Labour government during that time as well, and we're still and we've seen over that period of time and from before we've seen a decline in footfall to the town. We've seen a decline in the number of stalls on the market. We've seen a decline in the number of shops. We've seen a decline. As a Labour MP, what difference? What are you going to do differently that's going to bring trade into Batley? I think you've also in that period seen, though, two things that are really interesting trends that you can't just ignore. The first is the growth of supermarkets, mm. you know, and that has fundamentally changed consumer behaviour. You know, how many I go, I do all my shopping either either in a big supermarket these days or online, and that's the second big trend. You know, people are shopping online. Now, those two trends mean that that, that town centres of whatever whatever government, to be fair face an enormous challenge around footfall. People are choosing, opting to either vote, to, to shop online or go to a big hypermarket mm. supermarket. Now, against those two trends, mm. y- you've got to think really creatively about a unique identity for a town or a village or a, or a, or a, or a city, to be honest. And, you know, what, one of the things we've been doing as part of the Batley and the Hetman Dwight town centre meetings is looking for other examples of places which have managed to find a niche you know, whether that's somewhere like Hebden Bridge or Morley have done really well. And Click Eaton, to be honest, is a thriving town centre. They've got very high occupancy rates. They've got really thriving market. You know, they're, good, they're doing really well. So it's not impossible. You can book mm. the trend. So, And I think, I think politics is part of it, but yep. it's also about individual passion and leadership. And, you know, and, and, I, and I've really enjoyed convening these big public meetings to discuss some of this stuff. And it's okay. about, you know, leadership, showing leadership and initiative and, and enthusiasm for this stuff and okay. solving these problems. OK, breaking away from this slightly, because I've, we've got a lot of <laughs> messages. And I do want to get them all in, ho- hopefully, as well, inshallah. Um, OK, um, we've got a listener who messaged in. Sorry, excuse me before I end up deleting. Right. OK. Uh, Salam, super show. But I'm concerned Joe, Joe Cox seems to be identifying herself more with the so-called self-styled Asian leaders and out of touch. My, my apologies. Um, sorry. Uh, so where are we? Seems, no, to be ident- the biggest, <laughs> seems to be identifying herself more with the so-called self-styled Asian leaders and out of touch with the Joe Patel on the street. Somewhat pompous and they are hardly com- committed. I th- it's not you. It's them. I think they're talking about. So, uh, Socialists preferring meetings in houses and having samosas and pakoras. We want a Labour MP who values socialism. That's what the listener has asked. Um, I'm not exactly sure what part of the, that is a question or whether that's a statement. But have you been eating a lot of samosas and pakoras? Um, well, I have, but I, that's because I like samosas and pakoras. Um, I mean, I don't really understand what the point is there, but I, 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 I will but try and what, I, what it. I do, what I do accept though, is that you know anyone who wants to be the MP for Batley and Spain has to talk to everyone. Mm-hmm. You know, you you have to talk to everyone. You can't just talk to. But are you getting through? I think. Well, I think to, to be honest with you, under, the underlying question there is: Are you getting through to, as they mentioned there, the Joe Patel? Are you getting through to the average person who's in the house? Who's got no interest? I mean, the, the, the interest in politics is very, is very, very small mm. as well. Mm. What about the youth? What about young people? What about housewives? What about what about the people who don't, who are not in these meetings, these big grand meetings? Well, hang on, hang on a minute. So, I, you know, I just to repeat. I mean, the, for the last day, I've I've spent, I've probably knocked on about five hundred doors today. You know, I've knocked mm. on five hundred mm. doors. Now they're not they're not targeted at you know Asian elders, who, whoever they are. But you know, this is this is about. You know, people at home just watching the telly or making their tea or feeding their kids or one woman was changing her baby's nappy. You know, these are people who are just out there living their lives who I am talking to in their hundreds. The second thing is, you know, I've I've not just been hosting meetings for the great and the good. You know, these are people, these are meetings attended by everyone. You know, mm. they're about residents in Batley, they're about housewives, they're about, you know, this is about a real community initiative. And the third thing is, you know, w- one of the things I did, which um, probably... Probably some of your members came to was a, a big women only event here at IMWS actually we had about 250 women in the room now none of them well probably about one percent of them were Labour Party members or activists they were they were women in Batley and Spain and you know we had a really interesting 
evening, which was a celebration of some of the things that women do in our communities, which is an, an enormous contribution both to family life and community life. And, you know, it was a really interesting mixed event. Women old and young. Our youngest speaker that, that joined me on the platform was 13 you know, and we had head teachers there. We had business women. So these are this. This is not about an elite campaign. I am talking to everyone. And if your listener wants a chat, tell him or her to get in touch. And I am very happy to come and eat a pakora with him or her. <laughs> and you can bring some back here. I you think. think the question has a fear that you've been influenced by a certain clique rather than you know the, 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 the what they call it, the Joe, the Joe Patel. Patel. Joe Patel. Well, I'm rather than Joe Bloggs. <laughs> yeah, Joe Bloggs. I like that. I like that. No, no one influences me. I listen to everyone, and I'm going to be. I mean, this is one of the things that I think politicians need to be honest about. You know, I'm going to be very much an independent-minded politician if you elect me. You know, and I'm not. I'm not beholden to any one group or any mm. one community. And that's what what I think politicians need to be to be honest about. So, you know, come and talk to me. Okay, now then, we are going to take a very, very quick break. Give Joe a bit of a break. Give us a bit of a break as well. But if you do want to ask a question, remember, this is your opportunity. We have in the studio with us Joe Cox, the Labour candidate for Batley and Spen. If you want to ask a question, text or WhatsApp to 07460 We're going to take a two-minute break, and we will be back with you right after this. Online and on your home receiver, you're listening to Radio IMWS. Join the women-only Over 50s Elderly Lunch Club every Monday from 12 p.m. till 3 p.m. at the El Hikma Center. Enjoy a meal in the company of friends as well as gentle exercise routines including the use of treadmills and exercise bikes. That's the Over 50s Elderly Lunch Club every Monday from 12 p.m. till 3 p.m. at the El Hikma Center on 28 Track Road, Batley, WF177 AA. For more information, call 01924 Four five double zero triple five. Reach your customers through our radio, magazines and website with competitive rates, advertising on radio IMWS, Pegam, Unnisa and the IMWS website could give your business the boost it deserves. For more details, email info at imws.org.uk or call 01924-500-555. It is related by Sayyidina Anas radiallahu anhu that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, When a man marries, he has completed half of his religion. So let him fear Allah regarding the remaining half. The Al-Hikmah Nikah service launched by the IMWS aims to introduce prospective marriage partners to help fulfill this important aspect of faith. The service is open to unmarried Muslims who are permanent residents of the UK. For more information, visit our website at www.imws.org.uk Radio IMWS Welcome back to Radio IMWS You are listening to the election special and now our guest this evening is the Batley and Spen candidate, sorry, the Labour Batley and Spen candidate for the uh, up and coming general elections it's, it is Joe Cox of course, I'm sure everyone knows that already, um, but Joe, now we were talking a little bit about um, uh, regeneration in Batley Town Centre Um We've mentioned already, but, uh, Batley and Burston markets are going. That's more loss. Um, we've got the library that's under threat. Um, what do you think about the library? Well, I so I stood with the wonderful Ahmed Lunet outside Batley Library about six months ago and, um, and many others and very happily added my name to the campaign to save it. What an amazing building and service, you know, and mm. I'm a big believer that... The service that the library provides is not just about the books and they could they can be anywhere. It's about the environment and the building. So the two go together. Um, you know, and I, I, it's a tricky one, isn't it? I mean, let, let's be honest. Let's be clear, actually, that, you know, the, 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 Kirk, the Kirklees councillors at the minute are in a very, very difficult situation. You know, the, 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 the council we've, we've got locally have been subject to enormous cuts from central government and, Another point I'd make is that uh, the Labour Council here has um, suffered far more cuts to its budget than we've seen some Tory councils seen. So there's a bit of an element of disparity going on here around who's, who's actually taking the brunt of the cuts. 
Um, and that said, they've got some difficult decisions to make. Mm. Now, I, you know, I, I, I've, I've been to library meetings all over the the constituency, and I'm, I'm very happily supporting people who are campaigning for the the protection of their their library service, including in Batley. And I know Malcolm Haig from the History Group is doing mm. an amazing job at collecting signatures, and you know, Malcolm's brilliant. And if anyone's going to defeat the, <laughs> this decision, then Malcolm with together yeah. together with the Batley poets. But you know, look, this is this is a difficult time that the mm. council's facing. And, um, you know, I know that they're, they're consulting again now on what to do about the okay. libraries and they're trying very hard. And I'm very, very clear to David Shear that anything I can do to help him make sure that we save these vital services. One of the people I, um, I was campaigning with outside Batley six months ago was um, a, a local actress who, you know, learnt to, did most of her exams and le- revision in, mm. in Batley Library. And, you know, how many kids and parents out there know that if you lose that service, their kids aren't going to have anywhere to, to go to yeah. revise or read or for people to go find jobs or read a newspaper. And the last time I was in Batley Library, it was packed. You know, you had old yes. and young. It was a vibrant, it's a thriving community mm-hmm. hub. It's yeah. not just about getting books out anymore. It's about all sorts of different services. So, you know, I, I am, I'm, I'm desperately keen to make sure that we don't lose libraries. Okay. Okay, I mean, obviously, you've got several libraries across the constituency. In actual fact, they're under threat because obviously four. The ba- so there's four in total. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, sorry, four, four in total. Um, but um, the, the key there is what you've mentioned. The council are having to make cuts because of cuts in funding. Um, so at the end of the day, it's about funding. Where are you going to get the funding from? You've talked about regenerating Batley Town Centre. You've talked about wanting to save Batley Library passionately. Um, where are you going to get the funding? Well, look, on Batley Town Centre, that's not just about money, let's just be clear. I mean, some of these things are not just about money. Batley Town Centre is also about thinking creatively about what else you can do. So it's about encouraging businesses to invest. It's about encouraging, you know, sort of traders to come and try set up a new a new tr- i mean i know they're going to close yeah. the, the 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 market but there's there is there is still ways you can try and encourage this to not just be something that's about council investing money because we're mm. going to have to think differently about that and secondly let's be clear these are central government decisions that have been forced on us in yorkshire and we've got a bad deal compared to some of the southern tory council so let's not forget that but, you know, some of these things we're going to have to think creatively about. Um, the libraries, we, we, you know, we're going to have to think creatively. And I know some of the librarians involved in Kirkley's council are, are really thinking, well, how do we get maybe more volunteers in to help save costs? How do we run up, so set up um, community interest groups to run the service in the, in the buildings and maintain them? How do we even do an asset transfer so that we take, the communities take over the running of these facilities? And they're, they're thinking about it? something similar in Clecky yeah, You know, the, these things are not just about money. Now, the, but, but. Yeah, you know, w- this is ultimately about the council deciding what its priorities are. But would you, no, I'm going to put a question to your listeners, you know, and to you guys. You know, think, if you were a councillor now and you had, you know, millions of pounds of cuts to think, do you cut a children's centre, do you cut care for the elderly, or do you cut Batley Library? Now, you know, these are really tough decisions, and, I, I, and I'm not, I'm, no, they're, they're I agree, not I agree easy with, decisions sorry, Joe, to make. I agree with you that they are tough decisions, they are tough decisions, of course, but there are, I mean, if, you want, if we, uh, for a moment, just go to the council side of things, councillors have missed a lot of funding. They are talking about community groups applying for funding, which has been available to community groups, but not to councils for many, many years. Mm. The council have not promoted that. It's a Labour-led council. Why I'm has the sure. Labour-led Mohammed, council I'm not, not sure I agree with that, actually, Mamed. I think, you know, actually the council has promoted quite a lot of this stuff. And if you look at what More they're recently, doing... over the last, few, uh, last couple of years, in the, in, uh, whilst the um, library has been under threat and services have been under threat and the cuts have been uh, imminent, prior to that... There haven't been any 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 friends of groups set up, were there, for the libraries? Well, no, but hang on, that is a community-led initiative. So setting up a which friends been, of which group been, is something definitely that's a community-led which has been, initiative. Which is now being encouraged by the council. In, well, supported by the council in some cases, but this has got these, this is about community standing up and saying this is a vital service we're going to fight for and we're going to set up a group to save this. I mean that that's who's driving the, the okay. campaign to to save Batley Library, and sometimes the council is supportive and sometimes it's not. And and you know I, I'm I'm not going to defend the decisions, the, all the decisions that Kirkley's council have taken because some of them I disagree with. Mm. For example. I've hosted now two public meetings about Wycliffe Mount Sports Centre, which is 
which is about to be demolished, and that is a you know that's a, mm. a, a vital mm. community sports centre. If we're if we're in an age where we care massively about obesity and fitness, yeah. how can we be closing a sports centre now? It feels like that decision has been taken. I think the public consultation has been terrible on it, and yes. that's a council decision that I actually don't really well, agree I'll, with. I'm happy to disagree with the council yeah, on some yeah. of this stuff, but also I, I think you know that the issues are this is not always about money. We're going to have to think creatively. Mm. Let's remember who's taken these decisions. This is about a central Tory government giving Kirklees a bad financial settlement. And that, you know, that is on the record. You just look at what Tory held councils in the South are getting compared to what, what councils in Yorkshire are having to do in terms of the cuts we're having to see. Let's remember that. But, but thirdly, you. you know, we, there, are, there are things we can do, I think, as a community to protect these vital services if we care enough about them. And that includes all sorts of things like taking over asset management, so actually managing the building yourself, setting up a friends of group, campaign in, raising money if we need to. I'm, I'm happy to back those initiatives. But also, you know, on certain things, we've got to win the debate with, with, with the Labour Council here. And, okay. uh, and that, that some of these things are services that are worth pr- protecting and not and not 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 demolishing, Absolutely. and that includes yeah. that includes children's centres and right. care for the elderly as well as it does the libraries. I think I've I think I've, my, I've had my hands slapped by a listener out there. Joy's is standing for council, so let the councillors answer for that. <laughs> That's fine. Well, well done. Well, I but agree. Uh, but we are asking about the regeneration of Batley. We are asking about what's the rea- reality of the region or, or what, what what systems you've mentioned that it's not just uh, just fine uh, the the funding side of things. There's more to it than that. You have have mentioned the what the conservative government government have done over the four, uh, last four years to make it very difficult for the council but we can't forget that 13 years before that there was a labor council i mean you can't destroy everything in four years no and i i don't i actually don't think we've destroyed everything but if you look at some of the important I mean, let's, no, let's not just not take you, a step not, back. Sorry, not, if you, not you. The, the no, 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 no. But if you, take, if you take a step back to some of the things that mat- matter to the lives of your listeners, and this is everything from immigration policy to the NHS, NHS to schools, you know, the, the, there are some, bi- some big decisions taken in the last four years which are devastating lives out there. You know, the rise in zero-hour contracts, you know, the, the lack of, a, the lack of um, a bit, an ability to find a job, you know, this is this. Is, these are serious questions that this government has to be held to account on. These are decisions taken by this government. The tightening of immigration okay. re- legislation. So where, you know, where this are is the, stuff that we need Labour to find. If Labour Party is elected and, and in government, where are they going to find the money from? Well, so what we have not co- we have not any policy commitment the Labour Party makes is always going to be costed. So we've been very, very clear about that. The investment in the NHS is going to come from the things like a mansion tax on properties over two million. This is, you know, these are big decisions, mm. and we've been very, very clear that we are not going to make uncosted policy announcements and commitments. So you know, take that as read. We're not. This is not a time for flying out, you know, handing out goodies without costing it. And the Labour Party is absolutely committed to making sure we've got an economy that works and a, and a budget that's balanced. So, so you know, that that is absolutely. Right. And anything we say we will do, we will cost. And think we think, you know, including things like the NHS investment that we so desperately need. Okay, okay. Uh, moving on because we are short on time, but I think we might have to bring you back in on a one-on-one with me one day. Um, <laughs> uh, but bring it on, <laughs> um, Okay, um, okay. The, the question is: uh, uh, the question is, Joe, will you stand up for the rights of Palestinians? Right. This is a very, very obviously uh, passionate topic uh, amongst our listeners. Uh, will you stand up for the rights of Palestinians and condemn the murder of innocent Muslim children and adults by Israel? Um, yeah. Yeah, and this is not just a. An important issue for people listening. This isn't something that, you know, is part of the core of why I want to go into politics. You know, I, um, I've been an aid worker for many years in many, many conflicts. So I've, you know, I've spent time not just in Gaza, where I worked as an Oxfam aid worker, but I've been in Afghanistan, in Sudan, in the Congo, you know, places which are war-torn and devastated, working with some of the poorest, most vulnerable people, kids, elderly people who've been through hell and back again. And... In terms of Palestine, you know, so I was there um, just after the last conflict and the devastation that you see when you're there is it's it's horrific. You know, we were trying to take in medicines at the time and we're working with some of the refugee camps inside Gaza City. And the whole process of going into Gaza for any of your listeners that have ever been is the most dehumanizing experience I've ever had. 
you know, you, you have to walk. You're, like, you're treated like a cattle. You have to walk through these incredible pens and there are Israeli soldiers with massive guns pointing mm. down at you. Mm. It's horrific. And to get in and out of Gaza, as many of your listeners will know, you need a visa and it takes you months to get it and some of your family members will be on the other side of the wall and once you're in Gaza, it's like being in a prison. That said... You know, some of the people that I've worked with there have been some of the most passionate, principled, positive, optimistic campaigners you will ever meet. You know, people like Mohammed when I was there, who is a young student, wants to be a film director. You know, this guy had the biggest dreams of anyone I've ever met. And he will get there because he's passionately going to strive to. And it's for people like Mohammed and the other women and men that I met when I was working there that I will never give up on you know, a, a, a peaceful solution for the Palestinian people. It's one of the okay. reasons I want to go into politics and okay. it's something that I'm deeply committed to. Okay, now that to. We've, we have got, uh, like I said, a few questions on this, so we're going to start going through them now. Um, my voting decision, this is from a listener again, uh, my voting decision in the general election will depend on the candidate's position on Palestine. Uh, I will be more likely to vote for a candidate to become an MP who, uh, first of all, calls for an end of the siege of Gaza. Absolutely. I've been calling for that for many, 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 many years. You know, okay. yeah, yep. in, uh, including including working very hard at the United Nations when I was there to to lobby many of the UN ambassadors to say We've, this is time to end the end the occupation, stop the settlements. This is time to get back to the peace negotiations and find okay. a deal. Okay, uh, calls for the protection of Al Aqsa in Jerusalem against extremist Israeli settler attacks. Absolutely, deeply worrying things going on. I've been to Al Aqsa; it's an amazing place. We need to protect it, and I completely agree. Calls for the immediate and unconditional end to the occupation. Absolutely. You know, again, this is not something new. This is not something that's me just as a new politician saying, of course I will. This is something I've been writing letters about and campaigning about for years and years and years. Okay. Um, I've got another one here. Um, as an MP, what parliamentary tools is, uh, sorry, is she is, are you going to use to promote justice for the Palestinians? <laughs> I mean, this is so, you know, I was I was involved in I've been involved in many, many conflicts and many campaigns of this kind over the years. And, you know, the first thing I'll say is it's about getting the politics right. What's happening in Israel at the minute is that there is absolutely no pressure on the Israeli government to move in the right direction. And let's be clear, the conflict last we saw last summer The Tory government and David Cameron personally let me down and let millions of people down. He was inexplicably silent in terms of what the Israeli government was doing. I wrote a very strong letter to him last July to say, why are you not speaking out on this conflict? This is outrageous. And the Tory party do not have a good record on this issue. I haven't worked on this issue for many, many years and lobbied many, many, many Tory politicians. And, you know, the, whereas Ed Miliband has been very, very strong, pro-Palestinian, you've got many, many statements on there from Ed, very, very, very strongly back in the Palestinian cause. Okay. So what I believe, just to answer directly your questioner's mm-hmm. answer, is, you know, as a, so as a politician, as a politician, as a UK politician, what you can do is a lot. You know, I have seen people passionately committed to this cause make an enormous difference. Okay. You know, and it's about making sure that the pressure on the Israeli government from both the Americans and the United Nations and the European Union and the UK government is strong enough to force them to recalculate what they're doing so they will never again attack innocent people and kill those kids that we all saw on the beach and, you know, devastate mm lives and you know having seen communities try to rebuild their lives after okay. such a conflict this is horrific this is you support uh, the campaign for bds boycott divestment and sanctions yeah, well look i i i don't think we should i think no i don't support the the sanctions on the israeli government um, I think pressure on the Israeli government, diplomatic pressure, needs to be firmly ad- 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 implemented. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a fan of a boycott. I think it's indiscriminate. But I, th- I think there's a lot more diplomatic pressure we can put on that is just simply not being put on the Israeli government right uh, now like to what? change Sorry. the. Pl- well, this is, you know, this is all about. Um, making sure that the phone calls are made between the President of America and, and, the, and the key players in the Israeli government. Well, during and the last the, conflict, during the last the conflict Amer- it was mentioned that um, the Americans were talking to the Israelis and the Israelis were basically um, not willing to listen at all. Yeah, but the Israeli government is dependent financially and in trading terms on, on its relationships with both the European Union and the Americans. Now, as I say, I'm not a fan of a boycott as such, but I do believe that you know you, Israel can 
cannot exist without good trading relations and good financial relations with America and the European Union. Okay. There is a lot more America and Europe can do to make sure that the Israeli government are taking the right decision and put pressure on, you okay. know, and that we can definitely, definitely so do more. Why don't you think sanctions would work? I'm not ruling them out, and I've seen them work in many places. You know, obviously, we've seen South them Africa. in South Africa, mm-hmm. and I was a big, you know, big fan of the anti apartheid campaigning, and, you know, change is possible in these places after many, many years, and I think sanctions do work there, and I supported sanctions there. And I wouldn't rule out supporting sanctions against the Israeli government. It's just, I think for now, it's not, I don't think it's the right so cause. It's been 60 years since the Palestinians have been suffering. But it's been it's 60 not like years yesterday. since. 60 years of negotiations around the table again and again. Mm. And each time, every two, three years, there's, a, you know, uh, people being yeah. killed indiscriminately. It can't go on. No, it can't go on. It yeah, can't go and on. I think what we're doing as a country is not enough. I okay. definitely there's a, listen, there's a listener question here. Um, but look, look, but let's just be clear, though. You know, what we're not, we're not doing, we're not doing the basics. You know, David Cameron did not publicly condemn what the Israeli government okay. did last year. Okay, I mean, um, did, there's, so we're not doing the basics. Let's get the I don't basics. Think any political party Can, has done anything right, in the past. We'll, we'll That's get on, worked. Hold, hold on a second. We'll get on to that in a moment. I don't agree. I, just I, want, I don't agree. I can't I let just, that stand. There is a massive gulf between let you what come a back Labour on that, government would do and what a Tory government okay, would let, do. You look I, at the history books. Enormous difference. But we're still there. Again, let's, the ta- let's take the, Joe, let's change. Hold on a second. Let's take the Palestinian recognition. Right, hold on a second. Let's personally back. Now, now is the time that the Labour Party is saying, let us independently recognise the Palestinians. People okay. and the Palestinian Let's state. just ask this that question That is a first. massive difference between what the Tories that are That was a talking gesture. I think no, I might have to go into a break here. It doesn't um, have right, to Right, let's be. just ask this question be because this was gesture. related, this was a question that's related from a listener um, to what was being asked earlier. Uh, what are your views on the EU-Israel Association Agreement? Should it be suspended until Israel meets its human rights obligations? Yeah, you see, I'm sympathetic to that, actually, and I think I think that is something I would I would back. I'm, yeah. Because I, I actually, I mean, having again, having seen the human rights violations and seeing the settlement mm, building mm, and mm. you know i yeah i do okay. I, I i do think there is cause for the, the israeli government having breached human rights yeah. so you'll be happy to, to say let's suspend this so you would and that is the kind and just to, that is the kind of stuff that i do support okay so you would be happy to stand up and say right we need to suspend um the eu israel association agreement yeah i would we want to suspend this would, until something's I done i right, definitely would now, and in fact i've back, already said that just coming back onto the attacks during the summer um um ed miliband may uh, sorry condemned the attack on on um, on the on Gaza, um, nine days after the attack started, after eight hundred some, somewhere in the region of eight hundred fifty people had been killed. Why did it take him nine days? Ed Miliband. Yes. No, he said something earlier than that. Twenty fifth of no, July. No, he definitely said something earlier than that. I think he went He's, on the record he did, before on that. On the day before, he did say he, he was in America at the, the time, before. and he did, but he did not condemn it. He did condemn it on the twenty fifth of July. Why? I'm pretty sure that he condemned it very much faster than that. I'm to sorry, be but um, and if you look at the what Guardian he said, article, has very clearly said, stated. Well, I, I, I think. Oh, well, I, look, that it was. It did. It did. Now it did because well, a lot things, of a lot of things. people were he, listening to. I think he was talking. He was certainly talking privately in very strong terms bef- way before that. Okay. And secondly, I don't know if that's true. Actually, I'm pretty convinced he did it beforehand. But let's also let's just make sure that we're clear about the difference here between the prime minister, David Cameron, who had the power to massively influence mm-hmm. both the terms of the international debate and the Israeli government's decision and said nothing for months, inexplicably said nothing. And Ed, who came out incredibly strongly yeah. and, and re- you know, really condemned what the Israeli government was doing. Okay. Um, now then, um, sorry, cast lead took place in 2008, 2009. That was so- a cast lead took place, uh, the attacks on Gaza, yep. took place in 2008, 2009, yep. end of 2008, uh, December, yep. January. Um, uh, there was a Labour, Labour government at that time. Yeah, and, and we were pretty what strongly, happened? well, we were very strong in condemning the, the attacks in the Israeli government. And I was part of the campaign to make them go even further, to be honest. I mean, you know, look, and I, I am definitely on the end of an, a pretty aggressive positioning from the Labour Party on this stuff. I'm definitely on that okay. end of the spectrum. So but you, hang on, our record 
there was strong and clear. We vociferously condemned what the Israeli government was doing. Okay. I remember at the time passionately, and I was definitely in the camp of saying we needed to do far more. Mm. But but the Labour Party was strong. Now you know the Labour Party and the UK government alone can't change this. This has to be part of a concerted international effort. And you know mm. where I think David Cameron has failed, and where the Labour Party previously has succeeded is trying very very hard to reach a European position, which persuades the Americans to also move and be far stronger than they've ever been. Yeah. Okay. Now then, uh, you mentioned Ed Miliband supported the uh, vote to recognise Palestine as a state. Uh, um, let me ask you a question. Would, if a Labour government came in, would that be proposed as um, not just a superficial vote? Would, would a Labour government take the vote to actually recognise Palestine as a state without conditions? Well, we've decided that that is the time. It's the time to change to change the dynamic and now is the time to unilaterally recognize palestine now and i personally back that i think you know you, you talked about the fact this has been 60 years you're absolutely right something needs to change and the labor party has come to the position that now is the time to do this in the hope that it does tip the balance okay. you know and it, again like, I, I mean i've got i've got um, i've got friends in palestine i've also got many israeli friends who are pro-peace. You know, there are some people inside mm. Israel that are de- yes. definitely yes. campaigning. There are, I- what we need to do, let's be clear about this, what we need to do is give those voices space to get around a table. I mean, let's be clear. We, the parameters of a deal have been known for years. What we've never got right, that's true. You know, if you talk to people who have been closely involved in the, in the, in the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations for, for over the, de- the decades... The parameters of what they will ultimately agree are pretty much known. What we've never got right is the politics. We've never got right the space, the political space, which means men and women sitting down around a table and actually signing a document that says we will do the following. We have never got that right. Now, I believe that's what we need to focus on. We need to focus on getting enough international pressure on both the Palestinian and Israelis, mainly the Israelis, let's be honest, to get around a table and actually sign that document and bring peace to, to the Palestinian people. That's what I desperately want. And I will do everything I can to listen to your voters' concerns, your, your listeners' concerns, and represent that both in Parliament. I've also committed I will go to Gaza and I will do anything I can to use the contacts I've got in America and Brussels to make sure that this is a cause that in my lifetime, inshallah, we will see resolved. Right, okay. Are you? Yeah, okay. Uh, we can move on a little bit. Uh, now then, it's been estimated between, what, 500,000 to a million people who have lost their lives in Iraq following the 2003 invasion mm. when, when the Labour government was in power. And with... You know, recent sectarian violence showing no signs of slowing down. The death toll is still on the rise. Mm. And as a result, <coughs> the whole of the Middle East is in a mm. turmoil. All this happened due to the decisions made by the then Labour government and the Prime Minister Tony Blair. This is one of the most appalling legacy of the Labour, Labour government and in particular of Tony Blair. As Labour's parliamentary candidate, are you proud of Labour's record on foreign policy? And can we really trust the Labour Party again? I'm very proud, generally, of the Labour Party's record on foreign policy. I am dismayed at our, the aberration that was our policy on Iraq. And it was something at the time I was working for a charity that I campaigned vociferously against. I was there, you know, campaigning and sending letters and on the streets with everyone else saying, this is not a war that I want to be led in my name. Um, I am not proud of that decision. I think it's, um, I think, as I say, it's an aberration. In it, and, it, and I, you know, I... I'm deeply, deeply sorry that it was a Labour government that led us into that war. Now, in terms of what we do now, you know, and let's get into this. This is a big issue in terms of the what the UK will do. What do we do about Syria? What do we do about Iraq? Is there a role for us to help either civilians fleeing? My husband works for Save the Children at the moment, and Save the Children are doing a lot of work in Syria with kids that have been through the most horrific experiences and I've, I've done quite a lot of work myself with child soldiers and kids who've mm. lived through this stuff and let's be honest you know war is not a place for a child war is not a place for anyone mm. but not a child and you know what what we've seen in syria is the vacuum opening up that the international community ignored yeah. and in that space terrorism grew yeah. you know and then that was exported over the border into iraq and you know now 
I think there's some really big questions here about what can a UK government and what can the UK people do to either raise money to help innocent people affected by these conflicts or to have a foreign policy that we can be proud of again. You know, and that's why under Ed's leadership, I think, and it's certainly something I'm passionate about, we can get the Labour Party, and, and, and the Labour Party is in a position where we can have a, Labour, a, a foreign policy to be proud of again. And let's be clear, a lot of the things the Labour Party did... In, in government were good on foreign policy. You know, the, the intervention we made around Kosovo, my husband and I spent a lot of time working in the, com- in the Balkans yeah. after the, the, co- the conflict there. And, you know, the intervention mm. we made to save Muslim lives was something that the Labour government led, and we should be damn proud of that. And that is the sort of thing I would want to champion if, if we get a Labour government again. I think our listeners will appreciate the fact that you said that you're not proud of Labour Party's involvement Can in I? Iraq. Now, if you're elected as an MP... Would you be calling for Tony Blair to face charges of war crimes? Well, I want to see what's in this report, to be honest. I think, as a lot of people do, this big report and inquiry into what the Iraq war happened. The Chilcot report. I want the Chilcot mm. report. Now, I want to see that, and I want to read that. Um, I don't know. I mean, let's let's let. I mean, I wouldn't go that far, to be honest. But, but right I now, just... but I, you know, he let me down. He mm. he was well, the leader of my party. Well. Let, I think let he, everyone you know, down. He let me down. I was devastated by by that decision and. You know, I think like many of your listeners, I really wobbled about whether I could stay a member of the Labour Party. But okay. I, I came back listener to the question. fold mm. because I do believe that if you look at the history of the Labour Party, we've got a proud tradition of solidarity with peoples overseas, mm. wherever you are. Would you shake his hands? Would I shake his hand? No. Okay. Um, well, there, there is a question that's coming. I think you've answered most of it, to be fair. Um, but I'm going to read it out because obviously the listener has um, has written an essay. Um, <laughs> the Labour government led by Tony Blair took Britain to war in Iraq 2003. Uh, this was substantiated with the aid of the infamous dodgy dossier. The war resulted in countless victims abuse, uh, abuses committed by the Allied forces and left a huge humanitarian crisis. The current uh, situation in that region are a direct result of the instabilities that were created as a result of the war in Iraq. I think most of that we've already covered. What are your views on the war in Iraq? Was, was it illegal, justified, um, I mean, I think we can answer these very, very quickly, can't we? No, uh, it wasn't in any way justified, and yeah. I'm deeply appalled at what, what happened. Yeah. What are your views on Donny Blair? I think you've, you've just mentioned that. Uh, is he a war criminal? I think you've just asked that question, haven't you? Yeah. We've just received that, and you've just answered that. Has Labour's view on foreign policy changed since the last Labour government? Hugely, you know, and um, I mean, as I say, let's be clear, actually, in terms of Labour's foreign policy, we actually did a lot of good stuff. You know, we've invested a lot of money overseas to help communities in India, Pakistan, a lot of which I was helping in terms of delivering, to be honest. And a lot of, you know, your listeners will care passionately about that. And we did get some stuff right. As I mentioned, you know, the Mm. intervention in Bosnia to save many, many, many lives. Um, But, yeah, I think the Labour Party is in a is in a good position now in terms of its foreign policy. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think it's something it's it's certainly a passion that I've had for many years. And I'll be. I'll be watching, you know, like I, I think the Labour Party um, is, you know, is just much more principled in terms of its international approach. It's much more solidarity. It's much more of a priority for the Labour Party and always has been. We're a party of international solidarity and it's certainly something that I want to champion, whether that is Gaza or whether it's, you know, how we deal with India or China. Mm. This, these are big questions. And, you know, the world is a scary place right now for many people now you know and and some of that stuff is going to come home to the uk we can't shut our borders and this is one of the reasons the other reasons i want to get into politics you know we can't we can't shut the borders of the uk anymore we can't ignore some of these challenges whether it's climate change or terrorism or or war or conflict you know these things are coming to up to to our shores whether it's in in the form of refugees or climate change we you know or bad or or, you know no trading partners you know we need the world to be a safer place and the labor party Mm -hmm. i believe has always been the principled party in terms of a foreign policy that we can be proud of apart from the aberration that was iraq yeah okay um we we can move on are you you going I've got a long question. Are you ready for it? Uh, right can we move on to this? Because we've got some Go listener yeah. uh, questions that have come in. Get so the, obviously we want to give our listeners priority. Yeah. Um, okay. And, and you can send in your text or WhatsApp. I don't think I've mentioned uh, what the show is for a while. It's the election special on Radio IMW. Yes, I'm Brother Mohammed. Joining the studio with this woman talking on here. And the person you've probably heard 90% of the time this evening is the Batley and Spen Labour candidate, Joe Cox. You can text.
text us your questions on uh, text or WhatsApp on zero seven four six zero eight zero nine two one eight. Um, Joe, I'm going to read a couple of them out because they're all quite interrelated. Um, how will you ensure the Muslim issues are represented in Parliament? Um, and I've got another one here, which I believe is uh, sorry, not that one. Uh, that one. Okay, uh, Salams, will Labour, if they win the election, repeal or amend the CTS, the uh, Counterterrorism and Security Law, uh, as Islam and Muslims are being criminalised? Great questions. Um, how will I represent Muslim issues in Parliament? So w- one thing, just as a, side, a sidebar on that, um, we need more Muslim politicians, quite frankly. So if any of your listeners want to stand for council or get involved in a position where they're going to be in Parliament in the next five to ten years, come and talk to me because I want to support you. We need your voices and your experience in the in Parliament and in the Council. I'm already doing that with some candidates locally and, you know, stand up, be counted, get involved. It's an issue I'm passionate about as it is getting more women into politics. So that is an... interject yeah. on here because I know uh, you're quite keen on, on this and you've also uh, mentored, I think, uh, BME candidates as well as women. Uh, next year's general election... Three Tory candidates have been selected in safe Conservative retirement seats. Only one BME Labour candidate has been selected to fight a retirement seat. And as I said, I know you're supportive about increasing diversity in Parliament and you're mentoring BME candidates, but do you not feel... The Labour Party's records seem just tokenistic. Hang on a minute. Some may even feel it is patronising. Many BME voters see this as a good reason for voting Tories. What's going on with the Labour Party? I'll tell you why. I know Ed Miliband is very strong on getting fair representation of women on on, on the on the Labour Party. And he is in BME Absolutely. representation and I, as well. Uh, and I, I think quite rightly so. Mm. But in terms of the Labour Party's record uh, on BME candidates, what have we got? Uh, nearly a fifth of constituents of all Labour MPs are black or minority ethnic. Mm, mm, mm. I mean, you know... You know Hang the on, kind I, of mean, sort of I, I think you've not represented there. But look, if you look at the Parliamentary Party, mm. 93.8% percent white, according to the data, are... Of the whole... Of the, no, Labour Party MPs. Yeah, what's the Tories, though? It's about 99%. Yeah, but they're doing something about it at the next on. election. Hang on, yeah, well, hang on a minute. So is the Labour Party. How you know, many and, won uh, in, in a safe seat? Yeah, OK, a couple of things, though, to mm. say. One, it's the choice of Labour Party members who they choose to be their candidate. Mm. And it's the choice of BME candidates to put their names forward. So your listeners and anyone out there has got to put themselves forward. You know, you've got to put but yourself should, forward. You've got you to stand Labour up. Party should have a policy of increasing uh, yeah, you know, yeah, the I numbers. Yeah, I do, and I do. I definitely do. In the same way they do with, the, with, with women. I uh, absolutely members. agree. I mean, but let's be, let's be clear about another thing. I absolutely agree. The Labour Party should have a policy and does a lot to encourage BME mm. candidates to come forward. As I say, you know, I definitely committed to this. I've mentored, mentored women and men to mm. get to stand and you know, get involved. But the second thing is that the, the work I've done, I was chair of Labour Women's Network nationally for, for the last six, seven years. And, you know, that's not just about white women. That's about BME women. So, you know, mm. half of your problem, I feel I've been doing quite a lot of work on. Now, it's, a, it's also about Asian men who need to stand up and be counted. Mm. And the Labour Party needs to do much more to encourage them to come forward. But, you know, there's but quite a... But a place to stand at, you know, if, if there isn't a clear policy of, giving, of prioritising this. Like, Look, in the same on, way that the Labour Party do with women. Yeah, but hang on. Let's not put one underrepresented group, women against another not, underrepresented no, I, I, group I, I BME. I fully support now, let, you know, Labour let's Party be, stance on that. Yeah. Because uh, this is also about getting women BME candidates that. involved. Absolutely. I think, yeah. I think, I think Joe... But I agree. Yeah. I mean, but fundamentally, look, we've got a problem. There's a problem. <clears throat> look, there's a problem in politics. The House of Commons does not represent British society. It doesn't. Mm. There aren't enough women in there. There are mm. more. There aren't. There are just not enough women. There are more I, women. I totally there are men called that, and we need to do Frank in that. the cabinet yeah. than there are women. Yeah. And we've got, you know, we've got to get... 
we've got to get more women in there. We've got to get more working class people in there. We've got to get more BME candidates in there. This is something I am passionate about because we've got to change politics. Mm. Yep. So I, I actually, I totally agree with you. Let's, okay, I'm let's, gonna, let's promote, let's do I'm, much I'm actually going to bust in and cut this off <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. rather than increase it because the question was, how are you going to represent Muslim issues in yeah, Parliament? Yeah, sorry, and I got totally distracted, but I do think we had a, an interesting conversation. Yeah, and so we, we, will, hang it, we will again. Yeah, and let's do more on that conversation. Um, in the same in way fact, that, that was the last question I was uh, going to ask. Oh, <laughs> no, right, okay, good, good. But I mean, you know, a direct answer is in the same way that I'm going to represent anyone. You know, there's um, th- th- it's about talking to people, making sure that your listeners and the community here are telling me what's going on. Um, and so that I understand what is needed. Um, you know, Muslim issues are the same as you know Christian issues. You know, they're, they're different. They're, they take different form. But how do I represent anyone is, is for me, the same question. Um, but that said, what, what you know, do you I feel think there what, are What do you feel are the specific ones? For well, Muslims, I think there's, a, the there's a lot of specific issues right now. There's, I mean, there's your question here on counterterrorism, mm. your question on hate crime. Um, there's, you know, there are many issues that, that I know. What about the veil? Deeply, the veil, yeah, I support the right if you want to wear a veil to wear the veil, and I'd be happy to defend that. Mm. You know, whether it's single-sex schools, mm-hmm. I'm happy to defend the right to, to, for single-sex schools and for you as a parent or a community to, to choose to okay. send your child to a single-sex school. Oh. So all these are things that, you know, I, I would <coughs> want to listen to the community's interest, mm. both, and that's not just that's everyone. You know, mm. that's young and old, women and men, and, and, and do my, my very best to reflect the views of the community. Okay. And Just I do, and I really do think that that, that, that that that's the same as I would for any other community. But one of the things I'm, you know, I'm really interested in is is how is getting your advice. You know, you tell me how do I represent Muslim issues. Yeah. You know, if I win, I'm very interested in setting up, you know, regular dialogue meetings with this through the mosques or with women's groups about listening to what's going on and making sure that I am doing a damn good job at representing those concerns locally and nationally. uh, uh, Just before we get on to the CTS there, um, regarding uh, uh, non-stun halal slaughter, Mm. um, which is obviously there's been that video that's gone around and and it's been, uh, it's an abuse video that's now been turned into a ritual slaughter video. Mm. Um, It's been used by the media and it's been used by politicians. What's your opinion regarding that? And where do you think it is in in Parliament at the moment? So I know there's a discussion on the 23rd. This is a Tory mm. member of yeah. Parliament, Conservative member of Parliament, who's bringing forward this bill mm. to ban this. Let's be clear. Now, it's not going to go anywhere, from what I'm hearing. It's not got the support. It certainly hasn't got Labour Party back in. Have the Labour spoken, Party backs. Sorry, have you spoken to any of your Labour uh, Labour colleagues, any of your MPs in Parliament? Are they going to are they going to stand up and defend? Uh, I think right. I think you'll find that many will. Mm. Yeah, but have this, you is a, this is an issue that many Labour. Uh, well, so I was out campaigning today with Khalid right. Mahmood, who's the Birmingham a Member of Parliament, um, and I, I think his position is pretty clear. Let's see what he says in the debate. But you know, I this is the, the Labour Party is, is supports reli- religious slaughter. You know, and we're never going to ban that. So this is a this is a conservative backbench member of parliament who, let's be honest, is this is this is a bit of an attack on your community yes. from, from a conservative member of parliament. And it's not the first time he's done this kind of thing. Yes. And we need to stand up and say that is unacceptable, not just because this is about, uh, you know, this is unacceptable in and of itself. But this is an attack on, a, on an element of our community mm. that we need to defend. So, you know, I think that the, the fact he's doing this is outrageous and I would not be backing it. And the Labour Party is very clear that, we, you know, we support we, we don't we, we don't support this. Right, right, but have you actually sp- spoken to any of your, uh, your uh, uh, sorry, mm. any of the Labour MPs to actually say, look, are you going to go down? Are you going to? Are you going to? Are you going to? Are you no, going to speak out? I've been, I've been campaigning all day today, right, okay. and I, 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 no, I haven't actually sort of, but I'm happy to if that's yeah. what you know. If, if you think that that is that would be in any way useful, but I, you know what? Two things: this is not going anywhere. This bill, because the Labour Party is not going to back it. And, and, and secondly, you know, you can rely that member, Labour members of Parliament are and, not going to back this. And we've got to be fair, um, the petition that is online, um, we, we, which, which has led to this debate, um, the government department does actually say on there that the Prime Minister said that there will not be a ban on this as well. Yeah. So we've got to be fair to the Prime Minister yeah, on that that's as well. Fair enough, now, actually, coming on to this, uh, on the counter-terrorism and yes. security bill. Well, so the Labour Party um, on the counter-terrorism bill tabled a number of amendments, as your listener might know, and they were rejected and been rejected by the Conservative Party, so we're what? not ha- we're not happy with the bill. We don't think there's enough <clears throat> enough protection in it for civil liberties, and so we are not happy with it. As it, and, 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 you know, and, and we've tabled a whole series of amendments that I'm quite proud of actually, but that are not going to be supported by the Conservative Party. But wasn't it supported by the Labour Party with the amendments? Well, I don't think my understanding was the amendments didn't get through. 
Uh, well, with, so mm. with, with yeah. substantive mm. amendments, yeah. there were elements of it. Let's be honest, you know, we do face a, an increased threat of terrorist attack. You know, and so in this environment, you know, I, I think it's responsible to listen to the police and counterterrorism experts who are advising on a number of issues. Now, I, you know, you don't just listen to them wholeheartedly and adopt everything they say. You, you have to have the right civil liberties protections, particularly for communities that are particularly to targeted about this. So the Labour Party supports the principle of effective counterterrorism legislation. Absolutely. So what do you think is wrong with this particular bill? I don't think there are enough safeguards in it. And that's what the, the Labour Party tabled a whole series of amendments which I, the Tories will not will not. Do you support. think it will adversely affect Muslim Muslim, Muslims I think in that's this the country? fear. And I think the fear that we had as the Labour Party mm. was there just weren't enough protections in there. There weren't enough guarantees that it wouldn't. Do you think it's been rushed through? Yes. Why haven't the Labour... Because I think this is, sorry, these, are, these are big decisions that need to be properly debated. And, yeah. and why haven't but, Labour but, but, you know, asked rushed, for a proper debate? I think we have... I'm sure uh, how's it, Cooper how's has it prog- asked for How's it progressed so quickly then? Because, I mean, obviously, if I'm there was sure a, we've been if there was a split in the bit. House, if there was a split in the House, um, then uh, if the opposition was there to this bill, then there would have been a longer debate. It would have been taken a lot longer. The, the, the government can't just throw, uh, throw the bill through if no, you've got the opposition there. So the, have the opposition asked questions I in, in don't Westminster? don't know the direct answer to that question, Mohammed, but I'm sure Yvette Cooper has definitely asked for a, a longer time to debate this stuff. Let's say, but, let, you know, let's be clear. The Labour but Party tabled a whole series of amendments to this to improve the safeguards in this bill, and they have been rejected. You know, now, now you know it's not the Labour Party through, rushing this through; it's the Conservative government backed by yes, the Lib Dems. Yes, but the thing is, the opposition is there to stop things you're from right, getting rushed through. Right. You, you, so you, why no, hasn't the, the, the opposition, opposition? The opposition is there to make sure that we get good legislation and good decisions. The opposition is there to question yeah, where they feel the, the government is going the wrong way. And Mohammed, and we've been questioning and questioning and questioning and questioning this piece of legislation. But we've it couldn't possibly have because it started life in November, and by well uh, mm. last week. It was already uh, legislation. And in fact, some parts of it haven't even yet been agreed, as you rightfully mm. say. They haven't actually been agreed. So how has this legislation actually come through? And to be honest with you, if you look at mainstream media, if you look anywhere, there's, there's not, not been enough coverage. that's, that, that's been right. done about it. And if, la- if the, la- yeah. the Labour leadership, leadership had actually opposed this legislation, you would expect, and I would expect, for it to be on the front pages, left, right and centre. We well, haven't seen that. I think you give a lot more credit to the ability of the Labour Party to get coverage in a media that's not particularly positive I'm sorry uh, largely I'm sorry, to what I'm sorry. We're doing. but that aside but. but that aside no you know look I don't know the exact details of what Yvette has has and hasn't been doing on this but I know I've seen many of the letters and exchanges she has had I've seen the amendments that the Labour Party tabled and I know we tried damn hard to make sure that there were more safeguarding provisions in this piece of legislation yeah um, you've got uh, sorry our listeners just messaged in don't forget stop and search powers disproportionate yeah, used against right, BME right, I mean this, right, this, this right. whole reasonable like, suspicion say, no, the like, whole reasonable suspicion now yeah. uh, there are Muslim uh, Muslim Council of Britain have ra- raised a lot of concerns on this men who are uh, an organisation have been they've been, they've been campaigning on this. Yeah. At the end of the day, this legislation has gone through very very fast, and to be absolutely uh, frank and honest, it hasn't had opposition. And what we're getting at the moment is when it's an, a, and, and what's more is this legislation is very much targeting the Muslim community. Mm. You know, so what we're getting at the moment is when it's a Muslim only leg- uh, or a legislation that is against Muslims, Muslims are feeling victimised mm. because they're seeing it race through, mm. and they are not seeing the mm. traditional. Labour Party, who they expect to stand up, who they voted for, to stand up and defend them, not put something. If enough members from the Labour Party stood up, there would have been. It would have at least had to go. I mean, did it even go to a vote? I don't know the details, mm-hmm. Mohammed. I mean, and let's be clear. I've I'm, not I'm come not across a vote on it, no, and which let, means let, there had to have been very little actual objection against it. Because if it was objected against and the House was split, you would have a I vote. Think there was an all-party yeah. agreement on that and acceptance. It's it's been rushed through, and that's the reason. The problem is it's not been scrutinised enough. Yeah, and you know that worries me. And mm. but let's be clear: one, I'm not a member of Parliament yet. You need to vote mm. to get me in there, so I can scrutinise this kind of legislation and rep- represent your views. So vote Labour and get me in, so I can do a good job on that. The second thing is, you know, I this is part of a, and I, you know, I, I reluctantly say this, but I think this is part of a strategy that's been implemented by this government that is anti your community. You know, if you look at everything from some of the changes we've seen in terms of immigration policy to the welfare changes that were about to be implemented to this kind of piece of legislation, 
there is a there's a record here that is not helpful to the Asian community. Now, you know, and and I think we need to change that. We need to definitely change that. And you know, I, I get, vote me in, and then tell me and talk to me about the kind of concerns you've got, and I'd be very happy to be a you know loud spokesperson for. Well, for the these concern issues. from one of our listeners is all the parties who have supported the CTS bill, and it is it, it has received cross party support. It does say so on the government mm. website. I don't mm. think the government lies often, um, but all the parties who have supported the CTS bill have failed each and every innocent Muslim who will be a victim of this bill. Now, you mentioned mm. rightly you're not in, in Parliament at the moment, so there was nothing. That that you could have stood up in Parliament mm. and done. Um, however, you did mention also vote Labour. And Labour are there in the opposition. Mm. You are asking mm. the public to vote for your party. And yeah. the public have been asking this question. I've asked it, asked it on previous occasions, on, on previous weeks as well. The public are asking this question, why Labour didn't stand up and at least stop this legislation from rushing through. And, I d- and be I, properly I'll be honest with you as listeners, I don't know the answer to that. But what I do know is we tabled the a worry, lot of amendments the worry that is, did reflect, let's be just let me answer a lot of amendments that did reflect the concerns of this community now they weren't we didn't get them through now you know then you have to have a judgment about do you back the general provisions about improving counterterrorism provisions in our community in our country and um yeah i you know all i know is we table some damn good amendments and they didn't get through Right. Okay. Um, now then, um, sorry, I've got right. Okay, there's another uh, another uh, message coming in. Let's just we'll let that come in before we actually ask it. Um, I did have another one. Are you, have you got something? Yeah. Let's I'm just sorry. I've just, I know I've got a lot in here that I haven't read, and I want to make sure that I've read uh, as many as possible. Go on. Yeah. Let's just uh, focus a little bit on education. Mm-hmm. Uh, another <coughs> major subject, really. I mean, what what are your views on you know the Growing number of academies uh, springing up. I think to, to date, we've got nearly 2,000 academies, mm. uh, and it was an in- initiative that was started by the Labour Party. Mm. What mm. are your views on them? To be honest, I am more interested in the schools that are not academies, mm. I'll be honest, because that's where the vast majority of kids in our community go. So that's my priority. Um, and I want every kid to be in a school that reach, reach as academic excellence. You know, so that, that, that's definite. My, my emphasis, if I... What do you think the problems are with academies? Well, I think, you know, they, there's a danger that they can siphon off energy and, and, and money away from other mm. state schools in the area. That, that's a big worry for me. I'm worried about the lack of governance. And the lack of oversight. I'm worried about the lack of unqualif- the, 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 the unqualified teachers teaching in them. You know, that sort of thing. I'm worried about these kind of... The, 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 the fact that if you have an ac- academy in an area, it, ten- it can suck up kids from middle-class mm. families, that's to be honest, and leave other schools in the area without those kind of you know, mixed mi- classrooms. So are you, for, are but, you but more... But, look, but, look, sorry, go on. But, yeah. no, but, like, so, I mean, but I, I actually think the more interesting... I, I'm, you know, I broadly support academies. I, I'm not sort of anti-academy mm. per se, but I'm not a fan of them. And I think, um, as I say, I think, look, if I, if I get elected, my priority is absolutely going to be the 95% of schools that are not academies, where most of our kids go, where we need to raise academic standards. Um, you know, and I was talking to a teacher on the doorstep today who's teaching in a class of, you know, over 35. This is not acceptable. And the Labour Party's got a, a policy that no, no, no classroom would be, would be above 30 mm. again. And let's, re- you know, let's remember that at the end of the, the Labour government, you had, you had schools that, that previously had been, you know, falling down, kids sharing school books, you know, stuff we should never have seen in this country. We've got, we had a good record on education. And I, I definitely think that, you know, some of the policies we're putting now in place around making private schools give much, much more, much, much more back to the local community, a limit mm-hmm. on class sizes, more investment in teaching. I mean, you know, these are good that, things. With the academies, they have their own governance. That's right, that's because, right. Uh, which is you're why taking control away from local authority and putting it in the hands of maybe one person or the governing body and yeah. maybe a business yeah. who, who's supporting them. Yeah, and I'm worried about so many elements of mm. that, I'll be honest with you, really worried about so many elements of that. But look, I've been to probably about three quarters of the schools in Batley and Spen constituency. Mm. I've met many head teachers and, and teachers and parents over the last you know six months. And, and that, you know, what most people say to me is, we don't talk about academies. You know, that is an interesting policy question, and let's have that debate more fully. I'm happy. But what I'm more interested in are the rest of schools where all our kids go. You know, that's mm. what I want to talk about. Like, what are we going to do to raise standards? To be honest, from you know, preschool, under fives, 
right through primary and, and, in, mm-hmm. and into secondary. And, and how are we going to get kids the right vocational qualifications, not just getting, getting our kids into universities? Because mm-hmm. one, one of the reasons, and some of your listeners who've spoken to me will know this, one of the reasons I entered politics is... I want every kid in our area to reach for the stars. You know, we we've mm. got to oh, drill in That's aspiration to mm. kids. You know, I, it took me it took so much for me to get to university to be the first in my family to do that, and and then to survive university, and then to get out of university and try and get a job. I know how hard that is for working class kids yeah, to do that. Yes. And you know, we, but we've got to start right from when they're born to but make sure the kids have got that sort of aspiration. Isn't it? First of all, there's the increasing amount of fees they've got to pay mm. for higher yeah. education. Yeah, uh, and then when they actually complete their degree and come out of uh, university, there's no jobs for them. That's right. I mean, just to uh, pick up on that, what's your opinion on tuition fees? Well, I think they should come down. I think they've um, not wiped off. Well, I mean, you know, there's a big debate. This is a complex debate, mm. isn't it, around funding for f- further education? You know, I mean, what some universities say is it's actually now helped them in, in terms of the provision of quality services. I think it's put off some families, but actually, if you look at the statistics, if I'm right, quite a lot of kids from low income families are still going to university. So it's, you know, th- there, are, there are issues there. There are issues there. How are they going to repay the debt? I totally agree. No, no I totally agree. I'm not a fan. Mm. I wasn't a fan of, you know, introducing tuition fees. Although I think there's a serious question there about if you want to in- open up access to, to mm. higher education, how do you fund it? Mm. You know, and, and Ed Miliband's been very clear that we'd be, we'd be very much looking at bringing down the, 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 the fees that, that students pay and looking at alternative financing, okay. whether that's repayment of loans. And I'm, you know, I don't, I'll be honest with your listeners, I, you know, I'm open to thinking long and hard about how do you fund further education. And, you know, if anyone out there has got some great ideas or insight okay. or works in further education, wants to have a conversation with me about that, I think it's a really interesting policy area. The other policy area I do want to, again, listen to views mm. on is social care. Do we, how do we look after a, an ageing population? Okay. You know, I know, you know, we, anyway, but we'll, lot, we'll lots of other We'll come up to that. Don't yeah, worry about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there is, um, sorry, um, um, there is a... Um, uh, a, 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 a statistic here, um, which is from January 2013 to December 2013, um, the national rates of degrees were, uh, or de- uh, people achieving a degree, uh, were 35.2. Yorkshire and Humber was 30. Batley and Spain was 20.9. Yeah. So it shows a very short. <laughs> so, and that's a recent Come on, statistic. I mean, we've got to we've got to sort this out. We've got to. So yes. one of the things, and that, one of the key areas yeah. is tuition fees, because one of the things yeah, that scares people yeah. from going on into further education yeah, is tuition yeah, fees. Yeah. And didn't Ed Miliband say that he would bin tuition? tuition fees when he was running for the leadership of the Labour Party. Why has he changed his stand? I don't think he said, well, I don't know. Oh, I, I don't know. Well, then you're, you know more than I do, Mohammed, on that one. Why um, has he changed the stand? I, th- I, don't, I, I don't know what he said, I'll be honest. Um, mm. I What's think the he's latest? looking at, because look, look, it's what I said, this is not an easy question. How do you fund further education is not an easy question. I think anyone who says that thinks there's a silver bullet out there and there's an easy answer to that question is just mm. lying. This is a complicated area about how you raise money. Um, it's, you know, and if you if you want to fund higher education from the public sector, you don't fund other things. Okay. You know, so let's think. I, I think what Ed's done. I don't know what he said during the selection campaign. I can't remember. Mm. But it's going to be a major but, problem isn't it, for about then spend. It's going to be a major you know, problem. I mean, and it's no, so no, many students not being able to go into higher education, mm. and then there's not enough jobs for them to go around. What are they going to do? I know. Well, there's no incentive. One of the things that the Labour Party is committed to is just much more, is much more apprenticeships, which I think is really important. So, you know, getting kids, not, and not just sort of, you know, two weeks unpaid with nothing at the end of it kind of apprenticeships. I'm talking about serious like, uh, apprenticeships. We've also you know, made a commi- jobs creation schemes. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, th- th- we need these kind of things again. To, and we've also committed... But there's no that, guarantee of a job at the end of that. No, but I mean, but if you have a meaningful apprenticeship, which is, you know, I'm mm. thinking like a year, which is paid and you get training, not some of the, the kind of, you know, joke apprenticeships that you, you mm. see nowadays around, mm. you know, the, 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 the rates of, at which at the end of that you get a job were brilliant. You know, a lot of my family had apprenticeships and they went on to be electricians and plumbers and they, they you know, that was a, gr- a good career move. <laughs> But though we've lost that kind of valuable apprenticeship course and training, and that's something that the Labour Party is very is committed in its manifesto that we will bring back in. We've also brought in a guaranteed job after if you're unemployed and young after one year, then we will you know we will somehow find a job for you. You have that you have to take, and because okay. you know we all know that once you're in a job, it's far easier to find a permanent job. It's being out of job and being long term unemployed gets you out of the habit, mm. it's difficult, you don't have a skill, you, you know, that's what we need to avoid. But let's go okay. back to basics. We, this has got to start 
with our nurseries. It's got to start with primary schools. It's got to start with ambitions. Okay, we've got a listener who's mentioned who's uh, sent in a text regarding education. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, can you ask Joe, has she read the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad by uh, Robert Kiyo- Kiyosaki? Uh, in there is written, school don't teach on how to save uh, uh, slash manage money, instead how to earn money. Um, do you believe this should be added as part of the school curriculum? That's a really good <laughs> question. No, I haven't read the book, but I'd like to. Um, that's a really good question. Yeah, because managing your finances is absolutely key, particularly if you're struggling. Mm. Mm. So no, I mean, yeah, I think it should be. I, I think there's a lot of, I mean, that's a good question around life management skills generally, like, you know, parenting skills as well. I'm a big mm. fan of that. Actually, parenting should be taught much more effectively in the schools. I mean, I know a lot of teachers out there already do do that. So mm. let's not just say it's not mm. been done. But yeah, those kind of life management skills, like yeah. how do you manage your a household budget? How do you be a good parent? I mean, got, got, if anyone knows the question to that, please let me know. But, <laughs> you know, that these questions are about how you survive in the real world outside of school. And, yeah, I totally think we should be thinking about that sort of thing. And to be honest, I think a lot of teachers out there already are. Right, okay. Um, now that we, we were talking about uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, unemployment, um, job seekers, uh, people on job seekers allowance, December 2014, um, 26.7% of Batley and Spen who were on receiving JSA, uh, were 18 to 24. Mm. Uh, that's a massive percentage. Now, you've mentioned about apprentice, apprentices, um, and there have been apprenticeships both launched by the government uh, mm. as government initiatives and also by the council locally. They've not really worked. Um, otherwise, that figure would not be as much as that. You've got the second part, side of it where people who are leaving universities with degrees are having to take on lesser jobs because the job, jobs aren't there. Mm. So there's no job creation. How are you going to tackle the problem? <coughs> Um, well, you need to start with the education system and we need to do things like introduce policies around apprenticeships and vocational training much more effectively for those kids that don't want to go to university and those that do go to university. We need to get the economy working so that businesses are growing and booming so that there's jobs there for them. Now, you know, that's not all of that package is not an easy thing to do. But if you look at what the Labour Party is committed to in terms of youth and employment on both sort of, you know, a guaranteed job after one year of being out of work and a much more investment in vocational training and apprenticeships, that adds up to, you know, better sort of training for these kids and a breadth of, yeah, but we're a talking breadth about, of experience. We're talking that, about people who have received, who have gone to study, who have gone to university, done four, five, well, four qu- years of study. Your question was broader than that, man. Yeah, it was, it was broader the than point, that. The but point what about, about yeah. I mean, yes, fine, fair enough. Uh, we're talking about, uh, there we're talking about school leave. But it's not just the school leavers. There's people who are leaving university and there's no jobs there. What's the, what's the, what's the answer? Is there an answer? Well, I mean, there has to be an answer, doesn't there? I mean, this is about the future of our country. You know, we can't have people leaving either school or university or apprenticeships or vocational training, whatever it is they choose as a life choice, without a job. I mean, how is that going to work if you're 18 or 24 and you, you, you're not earning? So, no, we, we have to find a solution. Now, you know, but again, this is there's a lot of things we need to do there. We need to make sure kids are leaving school able to read and write. You know, the, the, the number of kids in our community that can't read and write by the age of 11, I mean, it's shocking. Um, so that, you know, we need to invest in, in reading and writing, which means parents need to get involved in that conversation and grandparents, not just schools. So kids need to be leaving school with basic skills. It's, you know, it's that it's that sort of basic stuff we need to get right. And I know a lot of teachers out there are working really hard and a lot of parents working really hard to make mm. sure their kids have got those basic life skills and skills. But, you know, th- there's, there's a bigger question around... You you know, how more... do we get our economy working again? And let's just be clear, the Conservative Party and the Labour Party have got a different approach on this. You know, the Labour Party believe you invest to grow fundamentally. And the Conservative Party... I believe, have choked off growth since yep. 2010 by cutting just at a time, cutting public so public investment, um, like the Building Schools for the Future program that was going to provide a lot of construction jobs for a lot of the kids mm-hmm. you're talking about. They cut that off in mm-hmm. 2010, which meant a lot of schools didn't get new school buildings, but also meant a lot of people in the construction industry didn't get a job and they had contracts cancelled. You know, so the Labour Party believes you, you invest to grow, and that's a big difference. The Tory party will cut public spending back to, as I said before, 
back to the 1930s. You know, the Labour Party believes that if you do that, that's not just about the public services like, you know, the swimming pools and the libraries we hold dear. That is about big, in, the big investment in the kind of infrastructure, the roads, the buildings that we need that not just deliver good services and good environments in for those services, but also deliver the jobs that we need for to our be fair, kids. Joe, I think Tories haven't really made much cuts in education, have they? They've maintained uh, no, but know, I'm much talking, of the funding. That's there. right, they have. They've made other changes mm. to education, but, they, but, but I'm talking more generally there, you, mm. are you, about Joe, a difference in approach around... How do you yep. how do you get the economy growing essentially? Yep. And I believe you 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 don't you, by cutting back on public se- public sector involvement, mm. education a little bit, but mainly other areas mm. of public sector involvement. The Tory government have choked off growth, you know, okay. and and the Labour pol- the Labour government would have done things very differently. We'd okay. have cut fair more fairly. We wouldn't have introduced a tax cut for millionaires. We would have we would have definitely not done that, and we would have cut more fairly. And you know, not seen the pernicious effect on families in this area that we've seen mm. over the last. Two years and, and you know the economy when the Labour government left left government left government when the Labour Party left government in 2010 was growing. Now let's not forget that you know there's a myth been put out there over the last few years by the Tory press and the Tory Party that the the Labour Party left the UK economy in a terrible state. That is not true. The Labour Party left the UK economy in a strong position. We were growing. We were on an upward trajectory about built you know job creation and and the economy growing again. And what the Tory government did, what Osborne did was cut back public sector investment, capital investment, which means roads and infrastructure, and the economy was choked off. Now, the Labour Party would have done things very differently, and that is one of them. And I think that is when you, know, when you talk about what are these kids going to do, well, we, I believe you need to invest to grow. Okay. You've mentioned, Joe, a lot there about what the central government, what central government needs to do, what they need to do down in Westminster. That's fair enough. Now, there's no guarantee that um, voting for you is going to mean a Labour government. Uh, it could be a coalition again. It could be the same coalition again. We don't know. What can be done on a local level? If you come in, but Labour doesn't come in, what can be done for job cre- uh, creation locally? Well, I mean, so one of the things I'm, you know, quite a few of the things I've been doing has been talking to local manufacturers about what they need from the council, which can be rate rent holidays or, you know, a bit of help here or there, finding new properties or whatever it is. There's space for a powerful local advocate to make sure that the business interests are represented to the council where it's a council issue. Um You know, and secondly, you know, a lot of the meetings I'm having are with local employers around, you know, how do we get their businesses thriving again in Batley? Now, you know, that there's there's this connection. I just think that there's connections that can be made if you're a powerful local representative mm. that, that, you know, some of which relate to national government, some of which relate to you being a powerful representative with the council yeah. and some of which relate to just kind of connecting people who've got good ideas and want to make things happen. OK, now then, um, I'm probably going to get a text message telling me <laughs> off very, very shortly for asking this question, but it needs to be asked, to be honest with you. Um, you mentioned there about being a local advocate. We're in a Labour constituency which is led by a Labour council or, 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 or being run by a Labour-led council. Mm. Now, why should the voters out there think, but, or, or rather, why, why should they feel that Joe Cox is going to come in and she's going to do something about this when we already have a Labour constituency? Well, I mean, the, the job of being a councillor is very, very different but to the job But we've got a Labour MP as well. Labour MP, that's right, you have. And Mike's given incredible service to this community for many many years um you know and mike's done a lot of stuff to push i mean you look at mike's record he's you know he's criticized the labor government he's he stood up against the tories he's he's also stood up against the labor council which you know is the job of a labor member of parliament you don't always have to agree with the council let's let's, let's be clear the council represent the whole of kirklees the batley and spen member of parliament represents your listeners you know, so there will be differences of opinion there about Kirkley's wide decisions that are taken and decisions that affect Batley and Spen. So, you know, Mike's done a good job at standing up for where there's a difference of opinion, and I would do the same. Okay. Mm-hmm. But you haven't answered the question. Sorry, what was which the question? Is, it's getting a bit why late. Should I, need a cup, I need a cup of tea. <laughs> why should people feel that you're going to be... De- right, we, like I say, at the moment, there's 26.7% um, of, of, uh, sorry, of, uh, of job seekers' allowances are 18 to 24. Why should people feel that you coming in is going to make a difference if a Labour government doesn't come in? Well, because, I mean, look, so a lot of the decisions that are taken in London affect our lives. So what Batley and Spen needs even if it's not a Labour government, 
is a powerful advocate in London who stands up regularly in the House of Commons and says, no, that is not acceptable in terms of a decision of how it will affect Batley and Spen. So even in opposition, you have to fight these fights for young people out there who are leaving college or don't, currently don't have a job. Mm. Now, whether you win them is a different thing, which is why people across the country need to vote Labour. Because, you know, I personally believe we need a Labour government to solve some of these problems. Now, you're not going to solve them overnight, but there's a difference between the Conservative government and what the Labour Party would have done and will do. As in, you know, and I, I think you're le- listening Sorry, to Joe, me to that's remember... that's going back onto central government, which you've mentioned already. No, but, but what, I'd, but, what but, about that? You said a local advocate, someone locally working with the local council. That's right, in three levels. Ch- there's three levels. Yeah, there's yeah, three yeah, levels. There's yeah. a local... So what would be different, you as the local advocate rather than Mike? What would be different? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I didn't... You, you Sorry, never, my you didn't apologies. Say, no, that's Sorry. fine. You didn't say what would be the difference. Well, I think we do many things similarly, to be honest. I mean, I would like him represent people's views and, you know, take a, take a different line if necessary with the council or support the council if I thought they were doing a good thing, like they did this week, which is vote to implement a living wage, which is a thing we should celebrate, which is a Labour council delivering for people in Batley and Spain. So when they do things like that, let's celebrate them, as Mike has done. And when we disagree, there needs to be a, a, a you know, a good debate between the, the Member of Parliament for, for Batley and Spain, as Mike has done, and the, and the Labour council. That's not a difficult relationship to navigate. Mm. That's an easy thing to do. You know, you, okay. I'm very clear that I represent, if elected, the, the people of Batley and Spain. Kirklees councillors represent either a ward or they've got a cabinet responsibility for the whole of Kirklees. That's pretty clear. You can just have those debates. And, you know, let, let's be clear. You know, being a member of parliament is about being a member of parliament. It's about representing this community locally and nationally, and re- sorry, locally and regionally, but nationally. You know, Batley and Spain, I feel has been sidelined far too long in many decisions, despite the best efforts of Mike and many brilliant ward councillors that we do have here. But actually, you know, we need... We're entering difficult times. This is a generationally important election we're about to have with some big decisions at stake about the future of our lives, all of our lives, all of your listeners' lives. You know, this community needs someone who is going to stand up and defend those rights locally, regionally and nationally. You know, we need a strong voice in London. Right, we've got some more text and I do want to get all the text messages in. Um, This one is, uh, there is currently, uh, sorry, in from a listener, there is currently a rise here of anti-Muslim prejudice in Britain and Europe. The vast majority of the victims of anti-Muslim prejudice are women. What are you do? Uh, what are you going to do uh, to? Sorry, what are you going to do to address this in your constituency nationally? Uh, if you win, of course, nationally. And how are you going to encourage Muslims to report uh, hate crimes against them? That's one question. So mm-hmm. what are you going to do about hate crimes and report the reporting of hate crimes? Um, should groups like EDL and Britain First be pre- pre-prescribed? Uh, sorry, proscribed groups. Will a Labour government ban these groups for promoting Islamophobia? Now, I've got another one that's coming that's quite similar. I believe I had a very quick look at it. Uh, This is the second one. Um, There are a lot of disillusioned people in the UK who hold the view that the current format of the democratic system does not represent them or does not work for the public interest. Russell Brand is someone who advocates, uh, advocates this and openly calls for people not to vote and calls for a revolution. Does he have a point? How do you address uh, some of the legitimate concerns Russell and others make? No, I totally disagree with Russell Brand, and I think it's um, it's utterly irresponsible of him to say don't vote. I mean, people died to give us the vote mm. in this mm. country. I've been in countries mm. where people don't have the right to vote, and they are desperate. They are dying. They're prepared to die to vote, and we did in this country. So, no, Russell is is funny and amusing and a character in many ways. And I find he writes incredibly well and is very persuasive, but he is damn irresponsible for saying don't vote to young people and, eld- and older just, people. You know, so no, I totally disagree with Russell Brand. Get out there, yep. register to vote, have a voice. If you don't like just what on, you're seeing, then vote against it. You just, know, have just, a voice. just on that, I mean, I agree with you that uh, we've got the vote and we should use it. Um, um, everyone should go out and vote, hence the reason why we're spending Friday nights uh, sat in <laughs> yeah, here yeah, for yeah. the last, uh, last, for uh, last <laughs> month or two. That, well, you've only got one. We've had three so far. <laughs> um, and we've got an interesting one next week, hopefully. Um, but on the views of Russell Brand, because Russell Brand has been speaking out quite a lot on a lot of things. He's been ridiculed by the media at times. Uh, he's had the media against him. That means that he's speaking out against the media. Um, do you agree with the points that is other than the like voting 
Um, I, I totally disagree with him on voting, but I think some of the things he talks about in terms of you know, who is winning and who is losing from the current system we've got in terms of bankers' bonuses yep. and people at the other end of the, 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 the pipeline on zero-hour contracts and, and, you know, out of work is absolutely right. You know, there's a, there's a fundamental problem with our with our country at the minute and our and Batley and Spen, which is inequality. There are some people doing very, very well at the top, thank you, and other people at the bottom who are really struggling. Mm. Now I know whose side I'm on and, and I'll I'll also tell you whose side the Conservative Party are on and it's very much on people who, who are incredibly privileged and often wealthy with hedge funds or, you know, private old boys networks. And that is the kind of politics I'm in this to change because that sort of government is never gonna rule for people in Batley and Spen. So, you know, and Russell's right on some of this stuff. There are some big changes. You know, we do need revolutionary change. Mm. But I personally believe you do that through the ballot box because that's the way to get permanent structural change. That's the way to really change lives. Stand up, be counted. And if any of your members are, you know, disillusioned and apathetic, then get involved. You know, stand up. Try it. It's really hard, to be honest, putting yourself up for election. But, you know, the, the, you get involved because you can make a difference. Or start okay. your own campaign group or run your own, you know, business. So whatever it is you want to do, get involved and change it. Yeah. Conscious of the time regarding oh, the hate the crimes. Um, yeah, so, I, well, hate I, crimes. so I, w- I had a really good meeting actually at IMWS with MEND and a couple of the other mm. um, organisations regionally working on, on hate crimes. They gave me a brilliant briefing and I committed to do a number of things, including write to the West Yorkshire Police and Crime Commissioner about hate crime reporting and mm. a couple of amendments that they wanted to see him implement. So I've, mm. I've done that to support them. Uh, I also attended a, a meeting in Leeds, actually a conference on hate crime, which was brilliant and, you know, really interesting statistics, powerful speakers and a really clear agenda about the kind of things that politicians need to be doing in the next in the next little while, which which is which is also about journalists taking responsibility for how they coverage story cover stories, as well as the legislation that you need in, in place to um, to protect people who are victims and encourage reporting of this. Um, one of the things I did speak to the police and crime commissioner about was safety forums so people feel if they are a victim of hate crime, that they can come forward safely and actually report it. And mm. no, we need to, sh- we need, you know, this is, we need to clamp down on this kind of behaviour. It is, it's, it's prevalence worries me and it's, you know, it's, it's unacceptable. I do think journalists carry a lot of responsibility for mm. either stoking up fear or, or you know, or, or negatively yeah. reporting stories that, that they should not be doing. There's a lot of responsibility yeah. for journalists in there. Okay, it's interesting you say that. Um, I want to move it on a little bit, um, but I just want to ask you uh, something else well, on that the, a bit later. You on the EDL, wasn't there? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a question on the EDL and Britain mm. first. Um, I'll tell you what, we'll take that first and then we'll, um, uh, I'll, I'll ask you on this. It's basically about the EDL and should the EDL and should, they be proscribed? Uh, should, should groups like EDL and Britain first be proscribed, proscribed groups? Uh, will a Labour government ban these groups for promoting Islamophobia? I think if they, prom- if they, you know, if they are guilty of crimes that where we've got legislation, like hate crimes or any other crimes, then prosecute them. No, I don't think ban them. Give them airtime and let them let them show themselves for the charlatans that they are. Because, you know, if you look at these groups, their their membership is declining. You know, they are not supported by the vast majority of people in this country. I don't think you ban people. I think you give them free speech and you, you, you show them that their arguments don't stand up and they've got absolutely no power to influence anyone. Just on free speech, uh, Joe, where do you stand? What's your position on free speech as a whole? Taking into account what happened in Paris uh, not too long ago. In where, sorry? In Paris. Paris. In Paris. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I'm a defender of free speech. I think it's one of the things that our country makes our country so special. You know, you let someone speak and you disagree with them. And your job, if you disagree with them, is to make sure that you've got stronger, better arguments and you're more articulate about in saying you're wrong. Um, so I, you know, I, I defend the right for anyone to, 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 to speak freely. I don't defend the right for, to, for people to have a platform. You know, and I think there's a difference there. So, mm. do, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give a platform to the EDL. I, mm. you know, I don't, th- I don't feel any obligation to give them a platform. But if they want to speak from a street corner, then they can speak what from a street corner. What about somebody wanted to ridicule religion, for instance, or some of their, you know, major icons in in, in the religion? Then, if they overstep mm. the mark in terms of legality, then you throw the book at them. Okay, talking about legality there, you've mentioned it a bit. I wanted to go back a little bit uh, on Islamophobia. Um, racism, there's laws to protect people. Discrimination, uh, the laws, there's sexism, uh, sorry, laws to protect against uh, sexism, against uh, anti Semitism as well. Uh, many forms of discrimination, there is law. But, it's, uh, but to protect people against Islamophobia, 
there isn't any sort of legislation. Mm. Someone can actually come out and call someone, abuse someone, uh, by, by, uh, abuse a Muslim, and there's no law to protect them. What do you think on that? Should there be a law to protect against that? I don't, you know, I don't know the details on that. And, and actually, but someone outside one of the mosques today was telling me about how he was subject to abuse in Batley Park recently, him and his son, and felt there was no framework or recourse to justice. So mm. I, don't, I don't know the details. I, I'm surprised it's not covered by existing legislation. But if there is... It's ne- not if you classified th- as racist or, or, mm. or, because Muslims are not class- classified, classified as, 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 a, as a race. race. Right, yeah, okay. Well, if if there's a problem or there's a gap in the legislation, mm. let's look at it. You know, if there's a gap that does not cover people who are being victimed, victimised, then let's mm. cover it. Let's sort that problem out. Very happy to have that conversation. Okay, and what's the Labour Party stands on, on, on Islamophobia? I mean, we see a lot of newspaper headlines which are very offensive and can be taken as very offensive. Not just uh, what, what you mentioned, but there's a... Um, um, but there doesn't seem to be... Enough, I mean... Um, the Labour Party can also propose bills in 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 in, uh, in Westminster. They haven't proposed anything to protect Muslims so far. What would happen? Sorry, what's to say to the voters out there that a <coughs> Labour com- a government coming in or a Labour MP coming into Batley and Spen is going to make a difference and protect people against Islamophobia attacks? Uh, uh, if there is a gap in the legislation that means that people who are guilty of these attacks are not being prosecuted or people who are victims of these attacks don't feel safe or you know, protected by the law, let's close that loophole. So what I would very be very committed to doing is having a conversation with people to look at the legisl- legislation and if there's a problem, let's close the loophole. You know, and, and so definitely up for the, having that conversation. If there's a problem here, let's, fi- let's fix it. Right, okay. Are you yeah. Right, okay. Uh, you're a bit of a climber, aren't you? I saw you climbing a, a little hill on Warwick Road uh, this afternoon. That's right, <laughs> now, that's right. I know you, you're into slicing climbing and mountain climbing. And what's on that running? How do you manage all that? Well, you, to be honest, you need stamina to be a politician. So uh, I'm a marathon runner. Well, I used to be. I'm training for a half marathon at the moment, and I climb lots of mountains. Yeah. So, but it's to give me stamina to do Any all this. Famous mountains knocking. you've climbed apart from the one in Warwick Road. Uh, in the well, the famous <laughs> one in Warwick Road. Well, I, I love the Yorkshire Dales, but I uh, I do climb quite a lot in Scotland. And in fact, my son, who's four, he's named after a mountain in Scotland called the Coolin Ridge on the Isle of Skye. All right. Okay. Now, there's one thing that I've actually noted mm-hmm. earlier, but the uh, uh, the conversation uh, continued to blossom, and I don't think we've taken a break for a long time no, as well. We uh, but that doesn't matter because it's very interesting. Um, is when we do when we do talk about Palestine and Israel, um, one thing that has to be clear, and one, uh, we, we we've clarified this on all the other programs as well. We're not talking about the Israeli people. We're talking about the Israeli government. Now, one thing that I wanted to ask you on this because we, I know you've already mentioned it, but I wanted a little bit of clarification. There have been peace talks, I like, after the last, uh, uh, sorry, the 51 day bombardment, um, um, in which over 2,000 people killed, uh, 400 plus who were children. Uh, it was terrible, yes. Uh, they were supposed to come round the negotiating table. The morning the, uh, the negotiation was due to start, Israel announced illegal settlements. Mm. Now, Outrageous. when will. When will the British government and a Labour government, if it comes in, or rather, will a Labour government, if it comes in, will it take action against Israel when they announce illegal settlements? Well, I would. I mean, I, I would strongly urge the Labour government to condemn. And mm. I mean, I, you know, I'm on the record for many, many years as condemning Israel, yeah. illegal settlements. And no. of course, the Labour, I, I strongly encourage the Labour government to do, to do such that. These, you know, they're illegal. That very phrase means these things should not exist. Mm. I've been to them. Yeah. They should not, they, you know, when you see them, they are built on land that does not rightfully belong to them. Mm. That this is this is this is damn dangerous and and illegal. So no, of course, let's condemn them and let's stop this. Yeah. Now you mentioned the EU treaty. What else would you do to actually? Because I mean, some the, the EU t- treaty would take months. By which time Israel have already stolen the land. Uh, the Israeli government, rather, have already stolen land. The settlers are already there. The settlers are armed to the teeth. Mm. And the Palestinians, are, I mean, we've heard stories here from uh, people from EP who who who, um, who go over just to chaperone children from their homes to their schools yeah, so no, when you've got such a such a trouble what would you be asking uh, if you if a labor government came in or even if a labor government didn't come in if you got into westminster what would you be asking a government to do to stop the illegal settlements just illegal settlements 
Well, so, I mean, you know, again, we get back to diplomatic pressure here. You know, the UK Prime Minister needs to be leading the charge to make sure that all the European countries are united in being very, very clear to Israel that this is illegal and has to stop right now or there will be sanction. Or, you know, there'll be sanction, not sanctions, but sanction, including, a you know, suspension of the EU trade agreement, EU-Israeli trade agreement. <coughs> um you know, and th- and that th- that let's be, that's not just language. That is about people sitting around a table like we're sitting here and having a very very difficult, frank conversation about the implications mm. of this mm. continuing, mm. which which does happen. Let's be honest. And I've been around some of those tables with ambassadors and ministers and watched this happen. It's never strong enough, and it's never it's never powerful enough. Yeah. But they do happen, and they just need to happen more regularly. What I would be doing is writing letters, having meetings, taking visits to the region, speaking to my friends in Palestine, and um, who are many, you know, community activists, and hopefully future political leaders in Palestine, and speaking to my friends in the Israeli Knesset, who you know, who are on the side of peace negotiations, and making sure I'm very much on the side of all those campaigning, whether it's human rights w- groups or Palestinian groups, or you know, any anyone who kind of wants to to see a, a peace deal in. in Palestine, I'm on their side, and let's create the right pressure on the Israeli government and on the Palestinians to come together and reach a reach a deal. I was just going to say a little anecdote. So, I mean, you know, one one of the things that I actually found most moving when when I visited Gaza was, and and the Palestine Palestine more generally was, you know, there's a group of Israeli grandmas. They're all about eighty, and they wear twin set and pearls, and they're kind of very very elderly women who every morning from six o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock in the morning stand at an Israeli checkpoint and make sure that Palestinians are treated fairly by the Israeli soldiers. They all have check, they all have little checkboards and they write off and if any Israeli soldier does anything bad to any Palestinian, they write the name down and the rank of the, of the Israeli mm. soldier. You know, there are people in Israel who in very difficult situations are standing mm. up for the Palestinian rights. So let's just let's just remember that there's you know there's always hope in this and you're mm. right you're absolutely right to differentiate between the Israeli government and the Israeli people. Mm. Mm. Of you course. Know, and, now uh, sorry uh, again I think I'm going to get my hands uh, wrist slapped there, uh, there is a message that's coming in uh, so I'm trying to buy, buy a little time there. And so if you do want to text in 07460809218 we'll be finishing very shortly. Well, you've only got a couple of minutes. I'll give you until 5 past that's about it. Um but Joe, um, you've mentioned there about uh, the whole campaigning and, uh, and everything for Palestine, um, and that's commendable. And we do uh, hope that if you do, if you are successful in May, that um, and we will hold you to make sure that you do do that. Um, do. But the voter out there. Well, it's not that long ago that we had a Labour government, and like I say, we did have it for thirteen years. During that time. Why didn't the Labour government do anything? That's the question they're going to be asking. What's the difference between that Labour government and this Labour government, that this Labour government is going to stop illegal settlements or, 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 uh, or, or you're going to, uh, sorry, yeah, it's going to take it, stopping illegal settlements seriously, whereas the last Labour government, unfortunately, didn't do anything to stop well, it. Well, I, I mean, I disagree with you. I think the lab, last Labour government did a lot to did try, they? no, to try and stop. Yeah, look at the stuff. You know, there were very but strong statements, a lot of diplomacy behind the scenes, a lot of effort to try and get the Americans to move, a lot of effort to try and get the European governments to move. The Labour, and I, you know, we, we were. You know, I remember because I was there working for Oxfam at the time, mm. going and meeting Labour ministers. But job, you know, they were they were doing. Now, do, let's not be clear. Let's just be clear. You know, th- this is a difficult, intractable conflict that's gone on for 60 years. Yep. The UK government is not the key player here. Yep. The UK government has power, and I believe as a UK politician you can do a lot to influence this negotiation that, that needs to happen. But th- this is... This, you know, there's only so much that a UK foreign minister can do, yeah. and I this accept is, that. But this is the question that the, uh, that the listeners out there and the voters out there are going to be asking. Yes, okay, if in the last time the, 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 the Labour government did a lot, they didn't get results. What's going to be the difference now that there's going to be results? Because at the end of the day, what we want to see is peace. We want to see yeah. an Israeli child be safe and without any fear. And we want to see a Palestinian child with that same safety and that same fear and the right to become whatever they want to become and, be, yeah, and, and grow agree. up. And, mm-hmm. So what's going to be the difference now that when 13, uh, over 13 years there weren't results? If there was effort, then there weren't results. What's going to be different now? You know what? I've worked in many, many conflicts from Afghanistan to Congo to Darfur to Gaza, and there is no easy solution to this stuff. You 
just have to try and change can happen. I sat on the board of the Burma campaign for about seven years, trying very, very hard to campaign for the for the release of Aung San Suu Kyi, for anyone who knows anything about Burma from house arrest. You yes, know, now yes, eventually yes. she was released. For those people who were involved in the anti-apartheid movement, that took a long time and a lot of effort. Now, you know, I am just a big believer that you don't give up. If enough good people stand up and say this situation needs to change, enough good Palestinians and enough good, good Israelis, enough Americans, enough Brits, enough French, we can change this situation. And inshallah, we will see it in our lifetime. Now, okay. that is not... You know, but look, you've also got to be realistic about this stuff. These are difficult, intractable conflicts. You Your listeners... However heartbroken they were watching some of those scenes from last summer and over previous conflicts, as I was, and there was nothing more heartbroken than talking to a grandmother, as I did in Gaza City, who's just lost her entire family. But this is a this is not you can't just solve this in twenty four hours. Yeah. Yeah. Your listeners know that. You know, what you can have, you can elect people who will passionately campaign and okay. do their very best to okay. show solidarity with the people okay. of Palestine. Joe, Joe Britain is a member of the Security Council on the UN. Mm. Now, how many times have they agreed with a veto with the US? Every time a resolution has been placed on the table. There's been a veto by, by the US, followed by Britain. Now, if we continue doing that, and it's happening under Labour government as well, nothing's going to change for, for the Palestinians. So can, I, I, um, can I just add on yeah. that, because I've actually got a text message with you, which is about the veto as well. Is it time the veto in the UN Security Council is cancelled and got rid of? Um, too often the veto is used uh, at the UN to avoid condemnation action for a blatantly just humanitarian cause. Now, I've got one more message that has come in, which we will t- take, but that will be the last one, because I know Joe has to get away. So, uh, apologies, Joe, but you are on schedule to actually beat Imtiaz Amin today. Woohoo! <laughs> so, so, it's, it's entirely up to you. This is, this, is where you're, this is where the listeners out there are wondering, are, are you up for it? I'm up for it. Come uh, on. Okay. So I the think it sets question, a precedent for May the 7th. <laughs> the first question, um, the uh, veto. So, the, so I, um, when I, w- I was, uh, I worked in, in New York at the United Nations for for a while, and um, you know, the the there's a lot of good things about the United Nations. Let's let's be clear, but there's a lot of bad things, and the the Security Council block and the veto at the Security mm-hmm. Council is one of them. And you know, I was definitely part of conversations there about. How do you reform a Security Council to make sure it's much more reflective of, to be honest, the world we live in? So debates about whether you include India and Brazil on there and, <clears throat> and other countries in a world that's very different from, from it was when the UN Security Council was established. So the UN Security Council needs to change. Mm-hmm. I think the veto is damaging for so many problems, whether it's, you know, whether it's, um, you know, conflict is in it, Africa or, or conflict in the Middle East, whether it's all sorts of things like climate change or so many it, human rights issues, you know, the, is, China and Russia often block that. Yeah. So, you know, and the US is often mm. negative on Israel and Palestine. So I've seen it. I've spoken to many UN ambassadors about this stuff and foreign ministers over many years. So I agree the UN Security Council needs to Form and the veto is a bad thing for international diplomacy. I mean, on the issue of democracy, isn't the veto actually against democracy? Because it's stopping, for, uh, stopping uh, a, a proposal or, or uh, to, to actually go to a democratic vote. So it shouldn't at least, I mean, you can understand where China and Russia are coming from. But shouldn't Britain, uh, America, shouldn't the democratic countries in the world actually say, no, veto is not for us? What, so what do you do? Are you proposing, Mohammed, that the UK and U.S. give it up, but let China and Russia no, keep theirs. No, no, because that was that's what would happen, though. You know, so you you have to negotiate collectively if you're going to end it, and you have to, I think, enlarge the Security Council so it's more representative of the world we live in, well, which is a world where you've got a South Africa, Brazil, India, growing economies in the world, which are much more powerful than they were forty years ago, and right. and you know deserve a right to be at the okay. table. I'm gonna I'm gonna um, actually do what a politician does, and I'm gonna retract. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna say that I'm not gonna say no. I'm sorry about that. Joe. I had to sneak that one in. I'm not going to say no that uh, Britain and America should give it up but, I, uh, but I'm going to say that Britain and America should look at, the dem- dem- at democracy and protect democracy and say right, democratically according to our nation's um, uh, philosophy and, uh, 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 and ruling um, we believe they should go to the vote that's what I'm and saying. They, but they regularly do say that. They regularly do say that and Never they try and push for on a vote. Palestine I 
Well, I'm not sure about that, but I think you're probably right. But then, they, you know, everybody knows the Americans will always veto. Okay. Now, I've got a... No, okay. no in situation. Okay. Yeah. This is a question that, to be honest with you, it was only come up uh, when Imtiaz was here, actually. Um, this is, uh, the gentleman has actually even uh, put his name on the message. So I'm going to... Re- usually, we only read the names out if they actually put, include them into the, ne- into the message, um, not if they actually just come up on the WhatsApp. Uh, but this is... Um, oh, goodness me. Let me... Yep. Uh, it's, my name is Af- uh, Afak from Heckman White. Um, Jazakallah Afak for listening um, Salam uh, Question for Joe Will Labour Look at the 18,000 rule For bringing spouse Into the country This is the 18,000 mm. pounds Ruling uh, For immigration Would yes. Labour Look at that Yes Absolutely Afak and, um, What would you do so we've commi- so the Labour Party is committed to looking at it and reviewing it. And let's be clear. So this, you know, under the Labour government, this was far, far lower um, and, and much more reflective of what people around here actually earn and can afford, can afford to say. And it's the right of every British citizen to be able to bring in their husband or wife to this country. And I would defend that to the end. What the, this Tory government has done is raise that to 18,000 in a way that many families... I mean, I've had many, many conversations, hundreds of conversations with people over the last six months with people who cannot afford that to hit that 18 grand level. I mean, who can afford that? It's ridiculous. It's not reflective of the way most people live or earn. Mm. So the Labour Party is, is, def- is committed to reviewing it. And, and you know, and the other thing that's gone, that's gone on in, in, in the last four years is you've lost any discretion from the Home Office on these kind of cases. What you had under a Labour government was just much more sympathy and empathetic response and, and much more discretion from the Home Secretary and officials that... If if a case was clearly you know such that of course there should be to, should be leave to to bring in a spouse, then then it was granted. What you've seen under this Tory government is any discretion go, which is dis- you know, targeting this community, targeting this community. So you know, great question, a fact and. You know, with, 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 you know, the Labour Party mm. was yep. much more sympathetic on this, as yeah. many of but your listeners there... will know. And also just to say, Mike Wood's done a brilliant job for mm. many, many families across Batley and Spen to help them who've been really struggling. And Dan Howard in Mike's office that many of you will know has worked yeah. tirelessly yeah. night and day to make sure that, that families who've been really struggling get the help they need to bring in their loved ones. And, yep. you know, definitely will have my support in that battle. Yeah, Mike. Mm. Well, yes, I think we can wrap up on that. Um, uh, that, that. That could open up a whole new debate. We could hear be <laughs> here until midnight, but but um, we will wrap up on that. I do believe there's some uh, something going through the high courts um, regarding. Yeah, that. there is. There is, and let's see. But what happens. just very quickly, isn't there a danger? I mean, I, this is a, to, to, uh, this is more opinion rather than rather than political side of things. But isn't there a, a danger that what you end up finding because at the moment it's eighteen thousand pounds across the country? Isn't there a danger that suddenly someone will turn around and say, "Well, that's." not right it, the, the cost of living isn't the same across the country let's raise it in london and lower it in <laughs> uh, so, or rather keep it the same in the north because one of the reasons why the conservatives have, have been have been doing this is to try and control immigration with the amount of people coming in from mm. europe mm. now how would labor cope with the influx from europe um which, which is fine i've got no problems with that <laughs> but but think, uh, the people coming in from europe and people coming from, from outside the eu I can't believe you just asked that incredibly complicated policy question at <laughs> quarter past just ten moment. on a Friday he's night. Had some cork on tea. No, but I, okay. I'm warming there's up a now. Lot, there's a lot. <laughs> woo, he's had a, he had a glass of coke about half an hour ago, and it's just <laughs> kicking in. Um, lot of issues there. One, let's crack down on unscrupulous agencies bringing in people from 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 Europe, yeah. Eastern Europe in yeah, particular, yeah. and undercutting local jobs and local salaries. That is something the Labour Party is absolutely committed to cracking down on, and I know there's a lot of support out there for that. You know, two. Um, um, you know, yeah. Let's let's worry about if there is a proposal to increase in London and maintain eighteen grand in in the north. That's you know that's that's definitely not something that I would support. And look, I go back to this point. It is the right of every UK citizen to marry who they want. You know, and we've got to defend that right to the hill, and we've got to we've got to make it make it easier for families to to to, to bring loved ones here and, and establish a family and a home. Right. Okay. Th- Do you expect them to speak English uh, when they arrive? I th- to English. be honest, I think but I think an element of speaking English is not just good for the for their. It's good for them. It's not just good for the country. So you, you know, but let's give them help if they need it. But yeah, I think actually, I actually do think it's, it's a good thing to be able to speak English I'm for yourself. I'm just thinking about an overage uh, say, pensioner but, who's wanting to marry somebody who's yeah, elderly. No, I agree. And let's, and let's, but this is where the energy to learn. But this is language where discussion comes in, Ayub. And mm. you had under the Labour government, you had discretion about cases like that. Under this government, the the, the policy on on speaking English has been much stricter. 
mm. you know, and, and I don't support that. I think much more discretion on issues like this is really important and sympathy and empathy. Yeah. Right. Right. Can okay. I just say, I mean, are we going to finish? Are you, mm-hmm. Did you have more questions? On oh, this? Um, are you, shall, we, shall we? Well, have we got another couple of hours? <laughs> <laughs> I think, that, to be honest with you, I've actually yeah. sat back just then on that, on, on, that, <laughs> on that topic because if we start on that topic, I know I'll yeah. start yeah, yeah, But yeah, no, Joe yeah. Cox, thank you very much for joining us on the Radio Iron Devil Selection special. We do hope you, uh, sorry, we do hope to have you as a guest closer to the election uh, once the manifestos and everything's policies are out mm. there so we can uh, grill you a little bit. Better yeah, at great. that time, <laughs> um, but just in case um, should I pass not meet, meet uh, we do wish you the best of luck for the forthcoming elections. Um, um, and uh, we've got coming up next week. Are you by? Right. Well, I think we're still waiting for a reply from. Uh Someone in Dewsbury, aren't we? We did receive a reply from Mr. Reevil um, uh, earlier today. Um, we did receive, to be fair, this is his second reply. He has got some uh, commitments next week. However, he's trying to make it. And on Monday, we should know, we should know for Hopefully. sure. Um, so, uh, listeners, stay tuned. We will tell you in the course of the week, and we will, of course, put it onto our social media site and mm-hmm. on, yeah, yeah, and, and, and onto the web, uh, uh, sorry, uh, on our social media site, WhatsApp groups, etc. I know Joe wants to say something. Go on, Joe. Well, look, I, I just want to say thank Thank you to anyone out there who's stayed the distance. <laughs> and um, I'm sorry that uh, you've had, uh, ho- well, hopefully an entertaining Friday night. Uh, but look, and, and thank you to both of you for a brilliant grilling. And, you know, this is exactly the sort of thing I'm in politics for. I want to be yeah. challenged. I yeah. want to be debated. And if anyone's got any further questions out there, then mm. look on my website, you know, Google me. I'm on Facebook and Twitter. Send the message- messages in. I'm happy to have an ongoing conversation. Yep. And if anybody wants a pakora and a cup of tea, I'm also up for that as well. <laughs> oh, really? Thank right, you okay. to everybody well, and on behalf of uh, Radio yeah. IMWS uh, Joe thank you very much uh, you certainly are a mar- marathon runner if you can stay with us uh, for over two hours uh, with our hard uh, questions uh, big thank you from, yeah. uh, from everybody yeah. here uh, and we wish you all the best Thank you. Thank okay, you. Uh, listeners out there, we do hope that was um, beneficial to you. We did. We have been saying every week this is about voting for an MP and a government, and it's important that we do make an informed choice. Now then, if uh, we have tried to read, I know we got a lot of questions in today. We did try and read them in line with topics. Um, if we haven't, and we, I do apologize, but as far as I'm aware, I think I've read them all out. Um, but if you have got a question and you did, uh, and you you didn't manage to get it in, please uh, email it to Pega at imws.org.uk because we have got um, all of the study that the Labour and Conservative candidates for Batley and Dewsbury who have agreed to answer Pegam's questions which will be published in the April issue. Um, Joe's looking more nervous now. Uh, so, <laughs> no, she's not. Okay, so if you do then uh, have questions, please email them to Pegam at imws.org.uk and coming up on Sunday I will be back in the chair with our beautiful children. Uh, this week it's the children of Dark Lane Anwarul Islam for Kids Zone. Remember, you can win a Chicano's meal by answering a name that Nasheed. So you've got plenty of reasons to listen in. Uh, Tuesday, we've got the Islam program. We'll be back here at 8 p.m. on Tuesday with the Islam program. Wednesday, 8 p.m., we've got um, a Gujarati program. And then after that, we might have not uh, anything else. But we will on Thursday. Hopefully, inshallah, we will on Thursday have current affairs. And next Friday, election special will be here sorry will be live here from 8 p.m we are hoping that mr reval mr simon reval the uh, mp for dewsbury the conservative mp for dewsbury will attend um uh, sorry will attend the studio he would actually be the only mp are you by um who would be attending uh, the election, election special mm. because he's the only MP sitting, well, sitting between the two MP between our two yeah. towns so it's actually sitting there's only two MPs really but never mind um, so we are hoping that that happens we will keep you informed um, but the election special will take, will will happen again and next week I think if we go over five seconds and Joe has beaten uh, <laughs> the time <laughs> but I'm not sure I'll have to I will have to I will have to because we did start ten minutes late sorry my apologies and <laughs> just might have won it okay uh, okay <laughs> we will have coverage up until up until May hopefully in Inshallah. That's it from me, uh, from Ayubai. Uh, yeah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.